this meeting at Tacoma Park City Council to order. Uh, the clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Williams. I'm here. Council Member Wright. Here. Council Member Clay. Here. Council Member Robinson. Here. Council Member Stevens. Present. Council Member Snipper. Here. Council Member Schultz. First item is just a. Quick agenda scheduling update. There are no additional agenda items for this evening. Uh, and for upcoming meetings next Monday, September 19th, I uh, call everybody's attention to the uh, first presentation on the evening, which is we will be visited by County Council Member Mark Elrich, who will be here to provide an update and uh, take some questions and comments. And if any past experience, guides me. My sense is that he will be here for a while. We will have a lot to discuss. So that probably will not be a 10-minute uh, update. Um, <clears throat> we're also, we also have scheduled a uh, briefing from the Tacoma Junction Task Force with their report on near-term recommendations and a presentation by the Enterprise Development Group on the micro-lending program and a continued discussion from this evening, uh, work session discussion of the Vision for City Recreation Services. The following Monday, September 26th, we'll have an update from the City Arborist, and we have tentatively scheduled a resolution for comment on the proposed Tacoma Langley Sector Plan Design Guidelines. Uh, that has been a uh, ongoing process, and the schedule keeps bumping because uh, the information from Park and planning has been delayed. I think we finally got at the very end of last week. Uh, so we keep uh, requesting delays from the county on the on their deliberations, and that's so that we can have a chance to comment. So that uh, we're trying to shoehorn that in whenever we've gotten it and had it long enough to be able to digest it and be able to provide comments. So that possibly could move, but I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> And we're uh, trying to get the elusive continued discussion of city committees on the 26th as well. I've had to bump that twice. Um, then I'll just point out that uh, we're currently scheduled for Monday, October 10th, to have uh, ordinance amending the uh, ethics code. Uh, we got word from the state that we are not quite under the October 1 deadline that we thought. So we have a little bit of time on that, and we're trying to get the revisions in there so that we can uh, have a comprehensive discussion on that. And we're also revisiting uh, authorizing installation of traffic calming measures on Hilltop Road. That was on previous agendas, has been bumped a little bit, but we're trying to get back to that as well. So that's some upcoming items and whether they are firm or tentative. <coughs> Uh, next is uh, public comment period for anybody who'd like to comment on anything that's not <coughs> on our voting agenda. So commenting on anything on a work session discussion or anything that's not on our agenda at all this evening. And if you come to the podium and identify yourself, and please keep your comments to three minutes. Hello, my name is Pat Lovelace, 7620 Maple Avenue, Coleman Park, Maryland, your favorite peace deli. I just want to say I'm glad to be back at the meetings tonight. And I had a wonderful time at the Folk Festival yesterday. I hope everybody else enjoyed it good, too. We had a good temperature and good weather and everything. After all that rain we've had for the last uh, couple, of, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, whatever it was. But I just want to say I had a wonderful time at the Folk Festival. Great music, great entertainment, and great people. All fun with the hope was had by all. All the children are out there and everything. Now that we've had our fun, we've got serious things to think about now. In a scant three weeks or so, we've got the uh, nominating caucus coming up to nominate our uh, favorite city councilman. You know who I'm going to nominate. Everybody knows that. But anyway, uh, in uh, 56, 57 more days from now, we've got the elections. So anybody out there who's not registered to vote, who uh, care about their city and stuff, who could possibly register to vote, come on out and register to vote. You know what? And because uh, uh, we got our elections coming up in 57 more days. You know, I think it's uh, November the uh, 10th, I think. I mean, November the 8th, I think it is. So we got to uh, be aware of that and uh, start thinking about who we want to uh, nominate for our city council October and also start thinking about who we want to vote in November. So I'm uh, glad to get that mentioned. Because, you know, I'm, uh, I'm always trying to get people to come out and vote. 
You know, because if I can do it, anybody can do it. Now I'm in uh, really bad shape now, and I still get out there and vote. So come on out and vote. Come on out and join me at the polls. I'll be out there with the peace sign like I was at the uh, folk festival. Like I will be at the street festival, hopefully. I'll be out there with the uh, peace sign and everything. So uh, come on out, everybody, and vote. Register to vote. Vote for your favorite candidate. Okay, well, anyway, we got the, uh, we got the uh, Walter Reed vigil coming up, the final vigil coming up on, uh, on uh, September 30th, on a Friday. That's coming up. Uh, the final vigil is coming up since they closed Walter Reed Hospital and they uh, moved all the veterans out. We're having the final vigil on the 30th of, our, of uh, September. So come on out, everybody, and join us. We hope to, we hope to uh, have everybody out there at, uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. We hope to have everybody out there to uh, pay our respect for our veterans and try to say no more war, no more uh, death, no more uh, violence, and keep our money at home. Take care of our veterans. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to tell everybody, glad to be back. Glad to hope, hopefully everybody will register to vote. Come on out to our, our, our uh, responsible actions we're having for peace and justice. And remember, Friday we're also having the demonstration to uh, end the death penalty. Uh, Troy Davis is about to be executed on the 21st. So we've got to say no to the death penalty at Tivoli Square in Washington, D.C., 6 o'clock. Thank you very much on Friday. Thank you. Somebody else likes to come in. Peace. Okay, Kay Daniels Cohen, uh, 19 Sherman Avenue. I'm here uh, for the Emergency Preparedness Committee to again remind you it's Emergency Preparedness Month. But first, the Emergency Preparedness Committee was proud to be a participant in the 34th uh, Tacoma Park Folk Festival. What a pleasure. Did I get the 34th right? Is that correct? Whew. <laughs> what a pleasure it was to drive up, be signaled forward, and told, and I'm going to tell you in my memo, there is spelled correctly but used incorrectly. Uh, there were Boy Scouts to help unload my car. And then, then at the end, to have this lovely AmeriCorps lad, plus several other volunteers who knew how to take a canopy down, help with the taking of it down. I never got to speak with Councilmember Clay about what a well-organized and well-attended event it was, with a great positive energy on an anniversary of a horrific event in our country's history. I felt, felt in sort of a time warp, back to the late 60s when peace and love were everywhere. All my many hats are off and serious gold stars are being sent for a job really well done. It was really a, a, a pleasurable experience. Well organized. It made you feel warm and toasty if you were a, a participant. Thank you. Uh, but back to reality and emergency preparedness month for a moment. Last week I spoke to you about making a list of the nine things that you need in your, in your, um, in your kit. A gallon of water per person, uh, for hopefully for five days. Food for five days. Clothes, at least one change per person. Medications, three to five days. Flashlight, that would be a flashlight that uses uh, a battery. A can opener, hand can opener. Radio, battery operated radio. Any kind of toiletries and a first aid kit. The one thing I didn't mention, and I think that uh, Buddy Daniels did, was a landline telephone. If you don't have a landline phone, you're not going to be able to do very much of anything. At any rate, if you, and if you have pets, make sure this list works in general for pets too. It's a human list and a pet list as well. The next step is to create a family emergency plan. And if you're living by yourself, try to work with either a family or some other friends. Your family not be, may not be together when an emergency strikes, so it's important you know how, uh, how you will contact one another, how you will get back together and what to do in case of emergency. I know it looks like a kid's coloring book, and in fact it is, but if you, even as adults, will follow this, it will show you step by step how to create, actually create a plan in any emergency that you might be up against. And all, it's also a lot, fun to, a lot of fun to color, even as an adult. It's fun to color. It's very, you know, peaceful. Um, as a family group, you can, should consider evacuation plans, family communications, utility shutoff, and safety skills. You may even need an out-of-town number to leave messages. 
Uh, all this is to keep you safe, hello, safe and calm in any event of an emergency. Making a plan is especially important when there's an emergency that has no warning. <coughs> the other thing to do is have a neighbor a neighbor to neighbor plan. Once your group or family is secure, check on your neighbors to make sure they're okay too. Again, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before you on a weekly basis, and I also thank you for all the work that you do here for the city of Tacoma Park. I'll be back next week with more. <laughs> Thank you. How y'all doing? My name is Abraham Coleman. I live at 641 Houston Avenue. I just wanted to introduce myself to you all. Um, I'm trying to become more active in my community, you know, so I will be attending more meetings. Um, I'm particularly interested in the recreation department. Uh, over in Houston, there's a lot of kids, a lot of youth there who it kind of it seems like they're kind of giving up on the whole school process and like their future outlook. So I'm trying to find more activities to get every, get the youth more interested in school and progressing in life also. So I'm going to try to my best to make it some more meetings. So just want y'all to remember my face. Nice to meet you. I didn't even honestly I'm sorry to say I didn't even know who the mayor of Tacoma was, and I've been here my whole life. So nice to meet you, <laughs> Mr. Williams. <laughs> So, can just point to himself? It's cool, it's cool. But, um, yeah, um, so anyway, I'll be trying my best to make it to as many more meetings as possible and become more involved. My goal is to try to get more of my generation involved in the community so we can fill these seats up for you all. So, Good. just wanted to get an introduction. Everybody. Well, welcome, glad to see you. Hi, I'm Roz Grigsby from the Old Tacoma Business Association. We run the Main Street Tacoma program. I see on your consent agenda tonight is a resolution for the continued funding of OTBA, and I'm here to say thank you. We, um, we are proud to be partners with the city in the Old Tacoma area on community revitalization and the economic health of that area. We've had a lot of successes, um, I think, there are some more on the horizon, which we'll keep you appraised of as they develop, but it's been, um, I think we've, we've made a good partnership here, and I appreciate the fact that, um, that you have uh, renewed it for another year. I also wanted to bring to your attention the street festival. Now that the fifth festival is done, everybody can come, and all those hardworking volunteers can come and celebrate at the street festival as well. It's Sunday, October 2nd. Um, and you'll probably have more reminders. There's further information on the website, TacomaFestival.com, so Sunday, October 2nd. Again, I wanted to remind you of something I've spoken to you before about the Be Smart program. This is money from the state of Maryland. There's $20 million for energy efficiency improvements to commercial buildings and homes. And Tacoma Park is one of the 20 eligible communities because we are a designated Maryland Main Street community. There's more information about that on our website, MainStreetTacoma.org, and it's on the home page. It'll take you through to the State of Maryland Department of Housing website and information. And last, I wanted to mention a few new businesses that are um, either just opened or on the horizon. One is Supergirl, a um, predominantly soup business located right across from the metro station next to Mayorga. They opened on Wednesday. A second one is Art Spring. You may have known it in its incarnations in Silver Spring on Ellsworth Drive. They are moving into the old tranquil soul space at 7014 West Moreland. I'm not exactly sure when they're opening, but they're already well into the move. Um, Knock on Wood, a tap dance organization which started in Tacoma Park and has been in Silver Spring for many years now, is moving back into the um, building on Willow Street, mm. in northwest, north, yeah, west, sorry. Um, so anyway, again, I think that covers it for me for tonight, but thank you very much for, for your support. I think it makes a huge difference. And uh, come to the Street Festival October 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. I've got one question. Yes. On the uh, energy efficiency, uh, I can see how if it was a main street program for commercial, it might be available in the old town area, but then when it's residential, what's the eligibility? The entire city of Tacoma Park is eligible, even though only the old T Tacoma area is designated a main street community. Because we have that designation, 
all the areas within the boundary lines of the city are eligible for this program. And that's eligible for both the commercial and the residential? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, as well as multifamily units. They actually have three categories. So everybody is included? Everybody's included, and the first grant that the state gave um, was in Tacoma Park. It was to an MHP project. Okay. So Good. I just want to say also uh, thank you for the thank you for what we're, we're giving OTBA again, but thank you to you because you really make OTBA go and um, have created so much success in the old town business district. So thank, thank you. Thank you. It's all about partnership. It's you know stretching limited time and resources to the best of our availability together. I think that's what makes it happen. But thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to council comments. Uh, and the lights may or may not be working again this evening. The parts haven't come in, so uh, council member Schultz, was that lit because it was lit? Or well, it, it turns out that it was lit because it was lit, but I also happened to be uh, one of those who wanted to make some public comments. Well, then, then you benefit from a late entry but an early light. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, that was my first comment to talk about this, this, the, the speaker button here. Speak request button that doesn't seem to want to... Uh, the, the parts have not come in. Oh, wow. Jeez, I think we were, this was a jet plane that we were uh, trying to construct. Um, one thing I want to report in our ward, walking down... Um, Sligo uh, Parkway footpath down near New Hampshire Avenue a couple days ago. I looked across through the woods and across the, the uh, stream uh, and I noticed that it looks like we've got some new occupants have re uh, at the homeless encampment that was removed by the uh, park uh, employees back last spring. It looks like what I could see, although it was uh, kind of overgrown in that area, which is the way it's supposed to be, uh, looks like a large dark blue tarp that might be covering a mound of things. So I'm hoping that um, we can get back in touch with the Park and Planning Commission, with the Parks Division, and let them know that that space may be reoccupied. Um, the second thing I want to mention is talk a little briefly about food truck vendors. Um, I'm, I'm all in favor of food truck vendors uh, and we have a number of them in the Tacoma Langley area uh, selling all kinds of different food and some, some of my neighbors who frequent them have said that such and such a truck is really serving fabulous pupusas and things like that, and that's great. But occasionally, these um, these vendors, if they're not properly situated, can become kind of hazardous to through traffic on streets. And uh, I suppose, to some extent, by the very nature of them, that they're going to generate a certain amount of trash from the people who buy food from them and then just sort of drop their waste along the streets, the paper and stuff like that. We've got a situation uh, on uh, University Boulevard um, close to Ann Street where a food truck vendor has situated himself on a private, private land and it's commercially zoned. Uh, it may be that it's an, a, a legal uh, uh, it may be from a zoning standpoint that it's legal. I don't know. We're still researching that. But I, but uh, it, 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 one of the things is that in order to open uh, a food truck vending stand, you need to get a permit from the county, and you also need to get an approval from the city of Tacoma Park. And I'd like us to give some thought to the possibility that in doing having the city review the um, such a permit that the that the council member in whatever ward the vending truck is proposed to be situated 
be involved in that uh, in, in, in that notification uh, so that the council member can take a look at it and, and make some uh, comments if necessary on the appropriateness of, of a particular location as it affects other uh, land uses, commercial and residential land uses, and as it affects uh, traffic in the neighborhood and that sort of thing. Uh, I, th I think that that's an important thing because these things can appear overnight. It's a little different than a, uh, a retail business moving into a retail storefront uh, because this is something that can appear where there has been nothing located before. Uh, we have a situation there now, and I only found out about it very late in the process, and it's a little bit frustrating for me because uh, I haven't had a t the chance until a day or two ago to um, enter or make any comments with regard to the, to the advisability of it. I've gotten feedback from some nearby uh, property owners, residents, that they're very unhappy about this location. Uh, I understand that staff is working, with, is working with me on this, but I think in the future, I think the uh, city council members need to be included in this process. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Councilmember Snipper. Hey, Mayor. Um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, taking after Doug Berry here. Uh, admonition. Um, so Friday night, um, I had a lovely evening, and it was ruined by... Uh, <coughs> I was driving peacefully along Piney, Grant, Piney Branch, crossing the intersection in Philadelphia, when a young guy yakking on a cell phone uh, turned left right into my car. He then backed up a little bit, turned a hard right, and scraped along the side of my car and took off. He, Continued to talk on the cell phone the entire time. Never, never stopped talking on that cell phone. Fortunately, I and a couple of witnesses uh, got the um, license plate number. Police were very uh, came right away and took all the information. And I assume that um, they will be able to track this guy down. Um, I have been driving for almost 50 years, and um, uh, so this is the first. Well, as you'll see in a moment, this is, uh, <clears throat> I'm a little upset about it. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, a lady yakking on a cell phone went through a stop sign and hit me. Um, prior to that, I had never had an accident in all those years, either while I was riding in a car, while I was driving in a car. You know, the research is, Talking on a cell phone while you're driving, you are distracted. <laughs> I have my own personal evidence on it. <laughs> so please, put the cell phone down. You know, if the cell phone rings, you feel you have to answer it, pull off the road, you know? Pick it up then. You know, it takes 10 seconds to pull off the road. If you need to make a call, same thing. You can pull off and, and make your call. But please, stop driving while talking on the cell phone. Councilmember Clay. Um, thank you. I have a couple of uh, things to talk about tonight. Um, and actually, they're related to community volunteerism and I think the spirit of service in the city of Tacoma Park. Um, the first one I want to talk about is um, the donations for the family of Orlando Hernandez. Uh, Orlando Hernandez uh, passed away. Um, last week, he was um, uh, he was electrocuted in um, after doing some storm work in uh, Ward Two, and um, I'm collecting uh, donations for the family. Um, I have actually been really um, really touched by the number of people who have made a contribution so far. And um, I can't tell you uh, how much it means to be part of a community that um, gathers together to, um, to help this family 
that is in is in need. Um, so if you would like to um, find out more about it, you can read about it in the newspaper. Um, it's also posted to several of this uh, community websites. But if you'd like to make a contribution to Mr. Hernandez's family, they um, uh, they need to collect enough money to be able to transport uh, Mr. Hernandez to his homeland and to per pay for the burial expenses. Um, and so I'm I'm um, I'm collecting money. You can send it to me at my house at 800 Hayward Avenue. Um, the fund is um, being managed by Casa of Maryland, and um, a couple questions. People have asked me a couple questions. You can send the money to directly to the uh, Casa Finance Center. You can get their address off the website, or you can send the you can send it to me at 800 Hayward Avenue in Tacoma Park, uh, Maryland. You write the check to Casa of Maryland. And you have to put a notation in the check that it's for the family of uh, Orlando Hernandez. Um, the questions that I was somebody asked if uh, if 100% of the funds go to the family, and the answer is yes, 100% of the funds go to the family. Um, and I wanted to share one other thing that I learned when I was um, when I was talking to Casa. Um, Mr. Hernandez was not uh, signed up with the Casa uh, organization. It was it was after I investigated. It was just so much easier to um, uh, work with Casa to collect the donations. Um, but one of the things that they shared with me is that they're doing OSHA training with all of their clients now, and it's one of the things that they're doing so that um, uh, folks who are casual laborers don't get um, injured or, or killed while they're working on the on the job. So they're doing a lot of work in this area to prevent this and other types of work-related injury and death. Um, if you have any questions about it, you feel free to contact me at my um, city council email address, or you can call me at 301-270-6888. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about the Folk Festival, um, which is also a really terrific um, event that that, um, that that also really embodies the spirit of service in Tacoma Park. This is my first year as chair of the Folk Festival after working with Folk Festival for eight years. We had a great festival this this weekend, but the the weather uh, worked out just great, and so we had a we had a great day, and um, we had a lot of people who came together to serve the community. Some in two hour slots, and some in one hour slots, and some by um, donating small pieces of things and. It's so amazing to be the chair of the folk festival. It's because like everybody comes out, and they all have their little piece that they do, and some of them don't sign up to volunteer. And and um, it, it's it's very interesting to me because the um, the way that the folk festival happens, like people would ask me questions, like I have no idea what the answer to that is. And they're like, you're the chair, aren't you? And I said, yes, but I have faith that it will happen. So just hold tight. <laughs> and sure enough, whoever's job it was to do that in the community came forward and, and there they, 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 they brought a canopy. Their one job is to bring a canopy and set it up in the same place every year. Um, and I can't tell you how really wonderful it is to be a part of a, of a community that is able to um, take care of people in need and, and celebrate um, when it is time to celebrate. I want to thank the city staff in particular for all of the work that they did, um, both the um, the police department and the public works department and all of the other folks who did things large and small to help out the folk festival it really makes it um, it really makes it work essentially um, and uh, one note uh, our ATM person didn't deliver our ATM and one of our one of our police officers overheard overheard this and he says he says I have a friend who has an ATM machine do you want me to call him? And he called and said, we got an ATM machine around 1 o'clock, um, which resolved all of the issues and let the rest of the day be uh, truly joyous. So um, I want to thank everyone who participated. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, first, I knew that uh, Councilmember Robinson and I were copied on information on a uh, sounds like a particularly raucous party in Spring Park on Saturday night. And uh, there some questions arose about uh, the cleanup and the permitting process. And I know that the uh, Neighborhood Association wants to be sure to get information back on that. And depending on the answers, that there might be something that the council or the staff needs to revisit in terms of uh, how that process is, is carried through and the, and the opportunity for 
uh, feedback about uh, what a particular uh, reservation and, and rental of a facility means. Um, so the chief has information on that one. Um, if you want to just share that now, that might be helpful. They had no permit. Uh, okay. It was a birthday party. It started out small. We were up there several times and quieted them down. And apparently, third time, we had to shut the party down at that point. Uh, it was a small crowd. We were up there twice during the afternoon. The officers uh, had them turned down on music they were playing. Other than that, there was nothing else illegal. Uh, they didn't have to, you know, as you well know, they don't have to have a permit, and they did not have one. Uh, we got called back in the evening hours. At that point, we made a determination it was time to shut it down. The crowd had reached about 150 at that point, and uh, very cooperative. It did shut the music down and did leave when directed to do so. It sounds like they left a lot of trash. Uh, they were in the process, according to what the officers and what I was briefed on this morning, were supposed to clean it up. Uh, of course, it got dark as they left, and whether they did, but we know who the people were, so we, we can deal with that in the future. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, I was happy to attend a 10th uh, anniversary of 9-11 memorial service that the uh, Tacoma Park Volunteer Fire Department put on yesterday at the fire station, and uh, that was uh, very moving and an opportunity for uh, people to uh, share locally their uh, remembrance and their gratitude toward uh, all of those who died on 9-11 uh, 10 years ago. Um, also, uh, wanted to let people know that I had a visitor last week who is a resident of Valencia, Spain, and is an honorary citizen of Tacoma Park. He was here as an AFS student in 1961, and he uh, contacted me before he came back for his 50th high school reunion in New England and said he wasn't going to have the chance to get back to the city but just wanted to uh, share some pictures and his uh, certificate showing his honorary citizenship from Mayor Miller and that just Tacoma Park had always had a special place in his heart and he always felt like a, a true citizen of the city and sorry he wouldn't be able to get back. Well, he called uh, the city clerk and said he was back in town and was staying at the Comfort Inn in Silver Spring and would love to come over and meet me and just express gratitude for the wonderful place that Tacoma Park is and the experience that he had had 50 years ago. So I met with him, uh, met his wife, and uh, extended our best wishes to them. And he wanted me to let everyone in the city know that if anyone ever wants to visit Valencia, Spain, they would be happy to uh, host them and show them around and uh, show them what a wonderful place Valencia is, just like Tacoma Park. So if anybody ever, ever wants to visit Valencia, Spain, let me know and I will give you contact information. You have a friend in Valencia. <laughs> is that like anybody in Montgomery County? Uh, Tacoma Park. Oh, okay. Only Tacoma Park. Um, also wanted to let people know that uh, I had the opportunity to uh, speak with both the governor and the lieutenant governor last week uh, at an event I was at on Wednesday, uh, thanking them for their support for uh, marriage equality in the state, and uh, had an opportunity to talk to them about a number of issues, and uh, it was very gratifying to uh, thank them for their support. Um, also, I see Pat Rumbaugh, the play lady here, and uh, I wanted to mention that Tacoma Park Play Day is at Tacoma Park Middle School September 24th, starting at 11 and ending at 2. And uh, there's, everybody's expecting a big crowd and uh, the opportunity to play with a number of things. Uh, you didn't get here for citizen comment, but uh, I'll give you 30 seconds to say anything you want to say about Tacoma Park Play Day. Good. Um, also, remind my colleagues that this Thursday evening is the uh, Maryland, Maryland Municipal League Montgomery Chapter Meeting in Gaithersburg, and it's going to be an opportunity to talk about uh, coordinating on any legislative initiatives that any of the cities and towns in Montgomery County have, and uh, kind of coordinating with other municipalities and see if we can make it a joint effort, uh, a county 
chapter uh, initiative and enlist support so that there were a number of things that uh, the City of Tacoma Park put forward for the MML statewide legislative initiatives that did not make it to statewide initiatives so that if, if anybody wants to uh, talk with colleagues on Thursday night about that, it's our opportunity to push that among our colleagues to get ready for the October meeting where we meet with the County Council to coordinate with them so that we don't get at cross purposes with our county colleagues on any legislative initiatives like happened last year on stormwater. That's this Thursday. That's this Thursday evening in Gaithersburg. Uh, I've got the information and it should also be coming out via an email from the chapter. And finally, I just wanted to let people know that I came across something on the uh, agenda for this week's Council of Governments board meeting and I let, wanted to let my colleagues know because I think there's a potential opportunity here uh, on, the cons on our board uh, consent agenda for Wednesday. There's a uh, resolution authorizing the executive director at COG to apply for a grant funding from the Walmart Foundation for a sustainability internship program in an amount not to exceed 150000 COG will collaborate with Mobilize Green and the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, of which the city is a member, to identify, recruit, and train 10 student interns or graduates from area colleges, universities, and community colleges for three months paid internships with local governments to work on projects that advance COG's region forward and sustainability goals, including greenhouse gas inventories, climate action planning, and green purchasing policy projects. So assuming that COG gets that grant funding from the Walmart Foundation, there will be opportunities in the relatively near future to apply for a three-month intern to work with the city on just the type of initiatives that we want to work on. So I'm assuming you want me to say uh, that we are in full support of that and put our name on the list. Yes. And that's all I have. Um, Councilmember Wright, I forgot you because of the lack of light. Did I get you? No, you haven't. Okay, sorry. Well, first I want to uh, thank Councilmember Clay for all of her hard work and service to make the folk festival happen. I know there's many volunteers, but she was the leaf and the chief, uh, the, the chief and leader in that effort, and, and uh, uh, I greatly appreciate it. I know I had fun volunteering. I had fun with my kids there. It was a great time, so I thank you. The second, just want to uh, let people know that the Tacoma Foundation Beer Fest is coming up on October 15th at the Katie Lee Mansion. I think they have nine brewers signed up at this point. Um, it's accessible to the metro, which has buses also, so people can uh, take public transportation, drink as much as they want, and then take public transportation home. Um, uh, What's the date again? It's October 15th from 4 to 8 p.m. Um, I, I've gone in the past. It's great fun, great conversation, great food, great beer, uh, and and all the proceeds go to to support the Tacoma Foundation, which makes uh, local grants. The last item I wanted to comment on is the issue that I brought up last week around referenda. So I um, think that we should consider referendum for this year's uh, election. I've put forth language for a uh, proposed referendum, particularly related to climate change. Um, and I think we should find time on the agenda to discuss that. Um, uh, what I would propose is that we try and find time uh, the next time the city manager is back, which would give us plenty of time to actually educate and encourage residents to come to that council meeting and comment on it. And then, really, we're not making a decision. What we're doing is making a decision to allow residents to make a decision about how much they want us to focus on climate change going forward uh, in the city, regardless of who sits in the city council. Um, what I propose does not is not um, it is binding in that it would be in the charter, but it's not binding in that it doesn't require a specific number, but requires that we start to to measure it um, and make progress and goals on that issue. Anything else, Councilmember Robinson? Um, I don't know if that's a call to for support of that idea, Josh, but I support putting it on the agenda to discuss. Anybody else interested in that going on the agenda? Sure. Okay. You got your four? I see four votes. Thank you. 
Do we have to make a motion? No. Thank you. Um, city manager's comments. And, and we're joined as city manager this evening by Deputy City Manager Suzanne Ludlow. Yes. Um, city Manager Barb Matthews is on vacation this week. Uh, she and I will both be um, next week at the International City County Management Association Convention, and then she'll be back the following Monday uh, for this meeting. Um, I wanted to just direct your attention in the agenda package um, on the report from COLTA, the Commission on Landlord and Tenant Affairs. It covers July 2009 through June 2011, and it is, it's actually interesting. It's worth your attention. Uh, I don't have any other comments. Okay, any questions for the city manager? Okay, seeing none, we will move along to our regular meeting. And the first item on the agenda is a first reading ordinance providing for the 2011 city elections. Would somebody like to move that move ordinance? ordinance? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any council comment? Any public? I just have yes. a question. Council Member Schultz. Um, I would like to get clarification uh, uh, as to whether the city has any rules or regulations uh, with regard to what kind of uh, campaigning can be done prior to the nominating caucus as distinguished from after. Two years ago when I was campaigning I understood that there were some limitations on that but now I've heard recently that there are in fact no limitations on when candidates can do that. I, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just curious to know if there's any, if, if what I've heard in the past was er erroneous and what I'm hearing now is correct. From my perspective, um, I, I don't see anything that uh, prevents a potential candidate from campaigning. They're, they're not officially candidates until the nominating caucus, but I don't see anything that limits that activity before. What about yard signs and those that sort of thing, the visible stuff? Is there that the same answer? Not not from my perspective, no. Not not that I can see in code okay. or charter. There's no prohibition on that. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Snipper. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the um, in the packet and the calendar is an entry. It says, on or before Friday, December uh, 23rd. It's the second to last entry. And it says that there will be a runoff election event of a tie vote. I thought we had switched to the voting in <laughs> which there wasn't going to be any. Right. That's true. But, um, there, you are. there could still be a tie. It is possible with instant runoff voting that after everything is said and done, there could be a time. That's true, I guess. And in that possible. event, there would have to be a runoff. Okay. Yes. I got um, it. And let me say, Ann Sargent, the chair of the Board of Elections, is here uh, in case you have any uh, questions related to the election process itself. And I didn't know if you wanted to say anything. Is there any public comment on this ordinance? And Sergeant Chair of Tacoma Park, City of Tacoma Park Board of Elections, um, I just, just to, in case you're wondering, in case you didn't want to ask, the process will be similar this year. The the um, electronic scan and voter verifiable system. And we've made some improvements. We've worked with the um, provider to develop some improvements. The scanner will be easier to operate, and we've clarified some of the procedures. So it should be better than ever this year. And I know one question that <coughs> yes. has come up. Councilmember Schultz kind of alluded to it, but the, uh, the question of whether there's a time limit on uh, political signs. That I cannot answer. I'm sorry. I deal more with the candidate-specific okay. okay. issues. Um, I think the signs have to be taken down within some right, short period after the election. 
that's uh, I have to look that up, but they they do have to come down after after the election. Okay, but there's no but, time, there's no time limit for the amount of time that they're up. I have to get back to you on that. Okay. I yeah. Let me get back to you on that. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, that's a first reading ordinance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None, and that will come back for second reading. The next item is the consent agenda, and there are four items. Uh, there's a single reading ordinance authorizing purchase of police radios. Uh, there's the uh, resolution authorizing execution of the uh, MOU with OTBA. And there are two resolutions for uh, appointments to committees or boards. Would somebody like to move the consent agenda? Second. We move and second. All those in favor, please say aye. Oh, sorry. First, it's a single reading ordinance. We have to do a roll call. Mayor Williams. Aye. Councilmember Wright. Aye. Councilmember Clay. Aye. Councilmember Robinson. Aye. Councilmember Siemens. Aye. Councilmember Snipper. Aye. Councilmember Schultz. Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. We will now move to our work session. Uh, we have two items on the work session agenda. The first one is a discussion of Vision for City Recreation Services. We said we wanted to do this uh, in a timely fashion. We asked the Recreation Committee to uh, come back to us with some information. And I'd like to go to the Recreation Committee first and uh, share with us uh, what you've brought back. And then we'll go to uh, Council discussion. Welcome. Thank you. And, Jay Keller, the chair. And who have you brought with you? We've got Ray Scannell, Pat Rumba, who's just joining the committee, and Allison, who's been on the committee for quite some time. Oh, and Sharon and Jawanda, who are also, I think, on the schedule for uh, being accepted onto the committee. They've just, we've sent in the paperwork a couple okay. weeks ago. Okay. Good. Welcome all. It's a good group. Well, thank you for this opportunity to respond to your uh, July request for more information. Uh, the, the City Council asked for guidance on both the mission statement um, and just the vision for the Recreation Department. Um, we reviewed a wealth of materials, interviewed community leaders and staff, and also with the help of a number of committee members looked at nearby recreation programs. And we began kind of informal dialogue using just a paper survey to folks, which we later turned into a survey monkey uh, survey and circulated that around. Um, I think we got about 250 total responses uh, to both the survey monkey and the paper uh, uh, that we distributed on the National Night Out. So some good feedback, um, not scientific, but uh, some a good sense of where the community feels um, we should be going with recreation. And I think very much in line with um, some of the survey work that was done in 2009. Um, on the mission statement issue, uh, the current mission statement on the website is the Tacoma Park Recreation Department is committed to developing and implementing quality programs for participants of all ages. We value creativity and diversity to achieve these goals, our programs and services are delivered in an effective and efficient manner, emphasizing safety, convenience, and affordability. Um, I'd just like to say at the opening that uh, the feedback we received overall um, was uh, we, that we got a great deal of support for the existing recreation programs and for the current staff. Um, that was a, a kind of good general statement of support across the board. Um, Rather than develop a, an entirely new mission statement, we really think the best way forward is for the council to agree on an operating framework, uh, priorities and approach, and to direct the department under a new director uh, and with committee help to proceed with revising the department's mission and goals. We further note that staff interviewed all noted that a key ingredient missing in this mission statement is community. So our recommendations are as follows. Um, we hope the council and a new director will continue or expand a public dialogue on the role of recreation in the community. A successful program demands community input. But we encourage the existing council to adopt a framework 
and priorities for recreation as soon as possible. We encourage the existing council to hold ward meetings on recreation in September and October, and we offer help. A recreation director could begin by visiting with each neighborhood association. The committee recommends the next resident survey be moved up in time and that specific questions related to recreation services be included with the input from the department staff and the committee. We think this is an excellent task for the new director. In terms of framework, uh, we think programs should employ a generous definition of recreation beyond traditional recreation programs to emphasize a healthy lifestyle, physical well-being, citizen involvement, and integration of differing cultural and economic communities. Recreation is a vital and necessary part of community life, equal, to, equal in importance to all other functions and services of the city government, and helps build and strengthen our community. Programs should be inclusive and appeal to a wide range of community members and with a strong focus on making a difference in the lives of young people. The priorities we've been looking at are life skills and leadership development, including job skills and entrepreneurship, common ground for diverse cultures, health and nutrition, art classes, fitness and games, job programs for teenagers. And for an approach, uh, we feel that recreation services in Tacoma Park will, or should, emphasize social engagement in order to break down socioeconomic and cultural barriers, mentor young people, contribute to building a more cohesive and neighborly community, actively integrate involvement of volunteers. I think uh, Colleen spoke so well about what just happened this last weekend and a number of people at the end of the day commented on how quickly we were able to clean up uh, at the end of the day and really put things away and it was just was a fun thing to be part of. Um, create more personal relationships with hard to reach community members and groups. And on this note, we're, we're really pleased at how the rec department has kind of stepped up to this and has been working more to build these personal relationships with particularly kids in the community. So that's a very positive thing. Um, help prevent crime by giving young people a positive alternative. Offer low-cost programs. Promote programs actively targeting and reaching different members of the community and aggressively reach out for participants across socioeconomic and cultural lines, regardless of their ability to pay. This will involve several initiatives. Uh, first, partnerships with the department, committee, and community groups, which I think is incredibly important. Volunteers and staff working together. Targeted outreach to diverse groups and expanded range of communications and promotion techniques. Augmenting, but not duplicating, existing programs really filling the gaps of programs that are out there. Put in another way, rather than being everything to everybody, Tacoma Park Recreation Services will offer something for different life stages, from tots to seniors. Its niche is, progr is programs that are local, convenient, low cost, and complementary to private sector programs. To reflect this direction and framework and approach, we believe that the department's name should be expanded from recreation to Tacoma Park Recreation, Arts, and Life Skills. And that's basically what we're pushing for this. Um, as I said, we, we, we looked at feedback from the survey work we did in the last month and a half. We looked at some survey work we just did within the committee of what the committee priorities were. We looked at the 2009 community survey. And uh, we, while we think that's an important process, we feel that we got enough feedback from folks uh, to make these recommendations. So I don't know if we have questions from the city council on this. Um, I just I just want to get two clarifications okay. on uh, on what you provided here. Just on the uh, in toward the beginning, you said moving up the next survey, right? And I wanted to just get a sense a reminder from the uh, city manager. Do we have a a next survey in the budget currently? No. We so, so there is currently no cer okay. no there's next no, survey there's, funded. There's no survey funded in the current year. No. Okay. 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 Uh, it was my understanding there was a 2012 funding for that, but no, that's not true. I, okay. My understanding is that that was not specifically identified. Okay. I don't know if the city manager 
at a proposal to bring forward, but, but okay. I don't yeah, believe that, it's identified. That was my recollection that there, that there I don't believe it's in the budget. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on the, uh, on the uh, changing the name to Tacoma Park Recreation Arts and Life Skills, whether that is something that is fairly standard that's now being done in a lot of places or whether it's something that is uh, new or whether it's kind of, gee, people used to do that and yeah. got away from it and now they're going back to it. Ray did some checking with a couple of others, and I don't know if you have a feel for that, of expanding the definition of... Rockville and Dinklageburg both call their recreation departments more than recreation departments. I can't remember which is which, but mm -hmm. one is, I think it's in the report. It, it's, it's helpful if you could speak in the microphone. <coughs> Come on the microphone. Thanks. Uh, this last, last page, this last page five. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in Gaithersburg, it's the Department of Recreation, Parks, and Culture. Yeah. And Rockville, it's the Department of Recreation and Parks. And right. in, in both communities, the emphasis is on more than just games. It's about community building, community organizing, really, in, in, many, in many ways. So it's, at least in Montgomery County, it's not uncommon. Okay, good. Thanks. And I, and I think the, the name change recommendation was from a sense of the committee members that recreation to some people has that broader definition uh, that is much more inclusive where I think for some people recreation just means kind of phys ed type activities and so we felt that one existing programs do encompass more than just the traditional definition of rec recreation and we thought it would be helpful to move along uh, the department and give people outside of the department a better sense of what recreation does. Um, one of the challenges we face with the Recreation Department is I think um, they get both credit and blame for programs that they don't do. Um, and for some of the wonderful programs that they do do, they don't get any credit for. So I think, uh, and in the survey work we would see people that would criticize and say, well, the Recreation Department does a, a terrible job with the July 4th parade or does, you know, they, they, they're not as involved uh, with with soccer, the soccer league as they should. So I think that clarity would help a bit more. Okay. Uh, other questions for the Recreation Committee? Council Member Wright. I just had a question I wanted to kind of clarify related to life skills and um, I, I think the, the word used is sort of job. Mm -hmm. uh, let see, is it employment or job program for teenagers? Job program for job teenagers. Program, yeah. um, and so, I kind of want to understand this a little bit more because there's kind of two ways that people often think about that. They say, hey, we need to teach people life skills, so we should give them a life skills class. Yeah. And then you go into a class, and I don't not know exactly what that means, but yeah. you somehow learn about skills related to life. Maybe it's like how to balance a checkbook or something like that. And then there's, there's a, an approach which sort of says you would design your recreation programs and the delivery of service so that in the process of learning about something like community gardening, or soccer, or art, or pottery, that you would um, gain life skills in the process of that around responsibility and yeah. timeliness and uh, what have you, or maybe even a job component in in the um, you know integrated into the 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 um, program because we run a commercial kitchen where kids have grown the the goods, uh, the, the vegetables, and then actually cook meals. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wanted to kind of clarify. Well, I, I mean, I think. Particularly with, with, with teens, sometimes you have to be a little bit more subtle about that, and you're right, work it in, uh, not necessarily as upfront saying these are job skills, but put in, putting them together in terms of, oh, let's go learn how to cook some things. Uh, we had, Ray and I met with the pastor of the, of the Presbyterian Church uh, this past week to really talk about, you know, what use is the, the city, the community might have for both the gym and if they had the funding to expand the kitchen up there, the kitchen facilities. Well, when we did uh, the, a teen focus group about a year and a half ago, a number of the teams said, boy, it would be great if we could do some cooking classes uh, that would be fun, that we'd learn how to cook some fun things, but also some life skills there, clearly. So, um, you know, I would leave this maybe a little bit more up to some of those folks in the recreation department to try and figure out, you know, how do you market these programs? How do you blend them together? Uh, for some people, it may be, you know, something that's fun that teaches life skills. And for other folks, it might be up front, we're going to teach life skills and we're going to do an accounting 101. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilmember Clay. 
Did you find any other recreation departments across the country that are called the Department of Recreation, Art, and Life Skills? Uh, in our vast research in the last month and a half, um, <laughs> we did not find any. It was just, I mean, really, literally, um, uh, not to be critical of any direction that the city council might give us, but um, <laughs> the request to gather lots of information in the middle of July when I was out of the country was, uh, um, took us a little while to get up to speed on things. So I think um, that's something we'd love to do a little bit more research. Um, Ray did a lot of calling around to talk to different folks, but it is one of the things trying to figure out, well, who is a comparable size to us and who runs programs a bit like ours. So did, is the committee married to the idea of recreation, art, and life skills, or just something more encompassing like the, the cultural activities or, or recreation? And, I mean, I've talked about is it possible to do more with parks and parks and recreation. Yeah. It doesn't really fit our, our model, but I think we just want something more inclusive. Yeah, I, I think we want something more inclusive and okay. something that really gives more definition to recreation than just the term recreation has for it. Because I, I think the department already does some work, um, some life skills work uh, with, with, with kids. Um, I think, you know, with the library, we t I talked to the librarian, and they talked about, you know, the, the computer labs there and those are certainly some life skills and mm -hmm. the computer lab work that's now part of the recreation department those are life skill issues where kids are learning to do DJ work things like that so um, I, I think we're already get into that uh, part of life skill development yeah, I think one of the one of the challenges with that is that another part of your report says that we only want to you know fill the gaps and so if we title our department with a list of activities that we engage in, people will expect us to provide the full range of those activities. Yeah. So, um, did you get? I'm interested in a couple of different things. I, I'm kind of interested in the approach to recreation, where we have leadership in the recreation department that has the capacity to do needs analysis. So more than just interviewing people from different neighborhood associations, but somebody who can really do a community needs analysis um, and someone who can do some analysis of the assets that we have and you've mentioned some of them so the um, the library computer computer lab all the music stuff that's there um, relationships with uh, the places around us other gymnasiums the commercial kitchen idea um, the swimming pool mm -hmm. Um, other other fields and and um, being able to develop innovative and effective programs. So I saw a little, you know, I saw in the report about you know to some of the existing stuff. Was there much commentary or interest in the city doing that kind of community development, which is really what my my background is about? So of course, yeah. I'm interested in it. But you know, is anyone talking about innovation and different different ways to engage our, our community? I don't think we did a lot of work on that. I mean, I think the biggest part of community engagement was trying to figure out ways of getting feedback from the community. And clearly with, you know, SurveyMonkey and National Data and stuff like that, it's very limited. And that's why when we got talking about a more scientific study of getting out and getting more information from people, that was certainly a component to it. Um, I mean, I think that um, ward meetings, I think uh, neighborhood association meetings are all ways for us to get out there as citizens to really gather input. I mean, in some cases, um, you know, people want some change, but I think more than anything they want to be heard about things. And I had one respondent who kind of sent me a nasty note about, you know, how unscientific my survey was and this really didn't help at all. And um, somebody gave me her contact information. I wrote her and said, thanks for your comments. This is, this is helpful, and we'll try and prove it next time. And she wrote me back and said, wow, thanks for the quick response. This is great. She was much more friendly about things than her original tone. And I think um, there's a place for that, too, in building community for people to be heard, mm -hmm. even if you can't fix everything. Um, sure. Well, I have to tell you that I face that all the time in Ward 2. I, I have a ward full of people who are policy ones, and as far as I can tell, yeah. 
uh, really good statisticians, and they have a lot of commentary on any way that we ever try to collect I'm information. Sure. So that's just the hazard of the job, and I, I commend you for that. Um, I have one other question to ask you. In the this, this survey results that came out last time, I remember reading and being a little shocked and a little disappointed that it seemed like the community was ready to give up senior services of, uh, you know, of the library services. I'm, I'm remembering that. It was kind of low on I the list. I think that was lower low on, on the list. Um, but your report here specifically mentions, as, as I, you know, and I support, as I frequently mentioned, that I think that youth services and senior services shouldn't necessarily have to pay for ourselves. The, um, those, are, those are communities, I think, with higher levels of need that don't really operate in most places on, on fee-for-service, 100% mm -hmm. um, uh, pay-for-themselves kinds of programming. When you were doing your survey, did you get a different sense than what came out of the 2009 piece? Did people address it at all? Did they not mention it? Uh, I think there was broader support for the seniors um, than before, and I, I, you know, I haven't done the full statistics on this, but um, it, I think it's interesting as you, when you do a survey like this, I think it, it's like a lot of issues, as you drill down and ask people specific programs, if it's just a general, well, what should we cut? And we made this a very simple survey because we wanted people to fill it out. People will go quickly do that, you know, oh, cut this, cut seniors. Well, do you really want us to get rid of the senior programs? And you ask them up front, I think they tend to back down. Well, well, if they're reaching people, if they're effective, if they're being used, I think uh, the general sentiment was, oh, well, I hear that there's some programs that they sign people up for and there's only one or people, one or two people that sign up. They should be cut. Well, realistically, they're doing that already. I mean, if it's only one or two people sign up for a program, they don't run it. So that's happening already. But um, I, I, think, I think, again, the need to educate the, the community about what programs we do have and the need to figure out better ways to communicate with a very diverse group of people out there is tremendously important. And I think in the report I put everything from maybe we ought to revisit the whole idea of an electronic sign, much as some people hate that, but some way so people driving by can see what's going on. Um, I know the Recreation Department, Faye, has been doing a great job of setting up a text program where she can text the teens. And I can tell you, as a parent of a 16-year-old, that's the only, when he's home half the time, that's how I get in touch with him. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a great thing that they're, they're showing some real initiative in. Um, I think with ActiveNet, um, Barb was very kind to work with Greg on this when we wanted to send out the survey. She said, oh, send it to us. We'll, we'll do the link uh, to ActiveNet. And so it went out to 3,000 people. And so I think we're starting to use that newer technology. And I mean, I think you have to be careful because some people are email compliant, some people are phone, some people want to do it in person. Um, I mean, I was pleased at the National Night Out how many people came up to our table and said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll fill this out. There was one young daughter and her mother who only spoke Spanish, and the daughter came up, I think she was probably 10 or 11, asked me what we were doing. And so I explained, she turned to her mother, explained in Spanish what we were doing. She translated the whole survey for her mother, filled out the survey at her mother's directions, asked her mother questions, is this really what you want, back and forth, right. and did this amazing job. And I thought, wow, this is this wonderful picture of what Tacoma Park is to me, is this integration of cultures. So. Council Member Schultz. Well, first of all, Jay, I, I want to say thank you, really on behalf of all of us up here, uh, for accomplishing what you were able to accomplish when a, effectively a fire bell went off in the middle of your vacation, in the middle of the summertime. And, and the fact that you got as much feedback as you did in such a short time is quite impressive. Well, we have a, we have a great committee, and it's um, yeah. well, everybody jumps in and helps out with stuff, and the feedback has been great. And we've got you know three new people on the committee that have just kind of they funnel comments back and well, then kudos to the whole gang. Uh, uh, and let me just uh, bring up a couple things. Um, you know, it occurs to me that even though you've got all this information that you did in a totally unscientific way, <laughs> uh, catch as catch can in some ways, 
it may, I, I really wonder that if you had gone out with a, with a sophisticated scientific random randomly distributed survey, if you'd have really come up with a whole lot of outcomes that are different. Because sometimes, while we all instinctively want to go, and those of us who have college educations, let's say, we all think, oh, well, we've got to have this, it's got to be randomized, or else it's not worth anything. Well, I don't buy that. Yeah. I think that, that there's, a, there's, you know, in some cases, it's, it's, you have to do that. But I, I would bet that a lot of what you got would be just simply validated by a much more scientific approach. Um, and I would also say the fact of a lack of awareness or a misunderstanding that you're finding amongst respondents about the rec department and what it does and what it doesn't do, it doesn't surprise me at all. I think there's that you could apply that to every department in, in, the, in, in the city. And that's not a, a derogatory comment towards citizens. I just think that people pay attention to things when they're interested in them. And when they're not, then they're not, and they just don't. And so um, it's always a, it's an inherent problem for government agencies to, to promote themselves because they're government agencies. They're not businesses out to make a profit. From my, from my experience of having worked on both sides of that thing. Um, I did try earnestly to organize a, committee, a meeting in Ward 6. Uh, tried to prevail on some of the community organization leaders there and never got so much as uh, an answer to emails, one way or the other, just nothing. So I'm curious to know of the survey monkey responses that you got, which was, well, the total was about 250 between the two kinds of surveys. Do you have any notion as to uh, what what parts of the city or wards that they came from, or or do you have a notion as to categories of people like seniors, uh, parents, you know, older adults, <coughs> young adults? We we did do categories. We didn't do the wards. Um, that's uh -huh. something that I after we set this out, I wish we had done that. Uh -huh. um, we got. Uh, a good response. The largest response, I think, was like 79 percent was from adults and seniors, and I think some seniors categorize themselves as adults and back mm -hmm. and forth. We didn't get any response from the teens, which is right. one thing I really would have liked to have gotten right. some. And um, I mean, you put it out there, and I see this as kind of an ongoing process right. of getting feedback from folks. And, right. and I think the hard part was. You know the timing on this. You know, getting people to fill out surveys uh, <laughs> in, in August. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's hard to do. A lot of people are just traveling, and uh, the, I think the, sending it out to the active net to folks who we have on, in the database is right. having some involvement. Right. Uh, although it's very interesting to look at some of the individual survey re results of people that are critical of the recreation department that have never used any of the recreation services. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I, you have to take some of those with a grain of salt, much as I looked at some of the comments from the recreation section of the, the budget game. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the first two comments were, interesting idea. I think we should get rid of the entire city council and the recreation department. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, you're bound to get some right. of those things. But um, <laughs> uh, I think, as I said, the, the people that responded and said they had used recreation services, I think pretty overwhelmingly were very happy with them. Uh, a few folks that didn't like a, a, a one program or the other that didn't get canceled or something, um, but people were, were generally very pleased and pleased with the staff. Mm -hmm. um, there's always more work to be done, but... Um, right. Well, thank you for this. Sure. Uh, this is uh, food for thought and at least uh, propels us along the process here. Um, Council Member Siemens, you got questions for the Recreation Committee? I, well, I <laughs> also wanted to uh, to thank you for the the work you did and the the kind of short fuse we gave you on this bomb we threw your way. I uh, appreciate your spending uh, summer months uh, working on this. I mean, in fairness to the council, you know, we did discuss uh, maybe giving you a year to do this task, and this was a compromise yeah. to cut it back to that amount of time. 
um, so as not to delay the hiring of a new director for too long. Uh, but I don't think anyone in this council envisioned that uh, this was a, a one-strike opportunity, that I think it's an ongoing process that we're going to want to keep the Recreation Committee much more involved and uh, that we want to give you clear direction on, on how you can help us in making some of these policy decisions regarding the Recreation Department. Uh, so I thank you. I think the, the uh, change in the name is brilliant. Uh, I think too many people look at the name uh, Recreation Department and automatically think they know what that means. And of course, all of us are thinking something different. Uh, and that's clear from many of the uh, discussions that we've had here on the council ourselves that uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, you know, think I'm wrong, and I think they're wrong. I, uh, we all have our own opinion of what recreation means, and so I think the the more we can clarify that, uh, I happen to like the name you came up with, um, but I certainly entertain uh, my colleagues' suggestions for other names. But I think it's important that the name be more reflective of what we want the department to do. I think it's important. Uh, to have that before we go out to get a new recreation director because it may not be a recreation director we're looking for. Uh, we may be going out and looking for someone uh, with that title that uh, is going to direct fun and games when uh, uh, what we as a body decide we want is something more than just fun and games. So I, I like I said, I think it's brilliant to, uh, to consider the name as uh, as part of what we define, um, as far as the, some of the detail you provided, I uh, I think it's great. I'm uh, I can't be disappointed with the amount of outreach you did, given the amount of time that you had and, and the season that we were in at the time. Uh, I think uh, again, I look forward to additional outreach. Uh, I think one could be could look at it and say, well, you, you've active net, so that means you've got an, uh, an abundance of people who participate in programs, and, and we might be uh, equally interested in, the, uh, in all those people who don't participate to see why they don't. But again, I understand the timing and, and don't, uh, don't criticize that at all. Um, but again, I think that, um, that just means to me that we have to continue this process uh, on into the future. Um, I still think it would be helpful for uh, this council to um, provide more clarity for uh, the mission and the goals of the department uh, prior to uh, going out and recruiting strictly uh, for the reason I think we need to let people know what the job is going to be before we go out to try to fill that job. I, I do think that from the feedback we got, we, we have over a number of years a pretty good sense of what the community is feeling about recreation. And I, the, I think a concern that we had as, as a committee was a lengthy delay in the hiring of a director and missing what we see as an opportunity of, you know, I think you're right, you want to you interview the right person for the right job, but I think you also want a new person to come in and direct them to do some of this outreach to the community and find out more information than what we've got. So um, I would, I think there was a general worry in, uh, in the committee that if we delay too long in finding, uh, uh, in placing a recreation director and in having them short staff, that that could negatively impact on the, on the programs. Sure. Thank you. And I just want to get one quick clarification. I think I know what you mean, but in the in the potential name change uh, and the use of the word arts, what it, what it reminded me of was uh, thinking about some of the things that we've started doing over the last few years in terms of the Arts and Humanities Council and various programming in here and, you know, art displays and changing every month in the atrium and those kinds of things. There's that kind of arts. And then there's, gee, is it more like uh, 
We've got the kiln in the room, more programs there. So the, just the sense of what you were talking about, like, gee, are you going to say, okay, we're going to pull in these other pieces or we're going to expand what we can do with facilities we have or a potential partnership with other facilities? Uh, and there's still this other arts and humanities piece. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a little bit unresolved. We were hoping to have enough time to talk to Sarah and meet with Arts and Humanities and talk a little bit more about this. There has been for years a bit of overlap. We've been lucky enough to have Alice on our committee. She's also been very involved in Arts and Humanities. And, um, you know, I think we envision the art part about this is, you know, the art that people do here in-house or in partnership with programs that we might identify. Okay. That's what I thought, yeah. what I wanted yeah. to make sure that you weren't kind of yeah. hidden somewhere else that we we, 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 were, we were crafting this work up until about 4 o'clock today. So uh, <laughs> it's in, in, you know, I, I luckily got uh, Cindy, my vice chair, was sending me emails as she was getting on and off a lobster boat in Maine. So um, I've been trying to start a rumor that she will bring back 20 pounds of lobster for the committee cookout. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a rumor I'm trying to start. And well, that, that's, that sounds like an art right there. And we're, and we're hoping to use the lobster to, you know, get a trip to Valencia to do a <laughs> I think it would be a nice uh, hook in there. I think we can all grab onto that idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Wright. Did you want to start off with? Shall I go down there, or? Yes. <laughs> it's nice down here. I look. Yeah. Like, I look. I like. Look you can raise that where uh, I get to you, come down you, here. You, you, you can raise it if you like. And you could even get used to, uh, in the future, coming back and uh, saying more from that podium. Exactly. How do I, how do I, I keep it? I just want to make sure one thing first. Let me show you the right presentation. Looks like you do. Okay. Okay. So, um, really, this is I, this, the design of this is to really help frame the discussion for us. Um, really to come up with a list of policy questions and options and it's totally in draft form so um, you know this is just one input uh, along with the recreation committee's input as well as city manager and staff we want to talk to and I envision that we would refine many of these um, as we go forward um, the other thing to say about this is that this is an amalgamation of interviews that I did with each of you. Uh, each council member was nice enough to take about between an hour to two hours, sometimes over meals, sometimes not, um, and have a discussion. First is just to remember, remind us of the history. Um, that we've, the council has expressed a desire for a recreation department to be improved for a number of years. But we should also acknowledge that it has improved, as, as Jay has noted and has heard from residents. Um, but we still exp we express a desire for further improvement. Um, and, and that's really on us, not on the recreation department, that we haven't clearly articulated what we want. What does that improvement look like? Um, and we need to do that. And that the departure of the recreation uh, director provided uh, a timely reason for the council to provide clear direction, and that the direction chosen might actually have an impact on the best type of candidate in terms of the nature of their experience and training. Um, and then we also feel that the recreation department and staff want to have an outstanding department just like the council does. And they, they welcome clear direction. So as I said, each council member participated for an hour to an hour and a half in interviews to share their perspective. I tried to uh, synthesize this information down into policy options questions based on commonly mentioned ideas and positions. So some of you might say, well, I didn't say that, or that's in you know, direct opposition to what I, um, I thought or stated. Um, I just tried to do the best job based on what everyone told me. And so if, if something's not there, we can, we can add it. Or it might be there because four members didn't uh, agree with you or three other members didn't agree with you, so you need to do a little politicking. Um, 
These options are not presented in any sort of prioritized order. Um, and we, you know, this is just uh, in future discussions and thoughts can be added to this. So the first question um, is just to confirm, you know, should Took Home Park provide significant recreation services and with what resources? Some of what I actually got from a few citizens, and I think Jay actually heard from them as well, was that the survey that was passed around kind of started from the position that we wanted to have a recreation department um, and maybe bias people in, the, in their presentation. But in all the conversations I had with you all, it was very clear that that wasn't uh, something that was in question in our minds, that we, we didn't want to reduce the overall effort um, or have the citizens rely on what the county provides only, and that uh, generally council members wanted to continue to devote the same level of financial resources and staff focus to the recreation department. But that there was some willingness to discuss budget increases or resources related to achieving a different vi vision if that was absolutely needed to achieve that vision. Um, this is uh, what I, I'm called uh, the integrated service delivery model used for programming. And this is in large part thanks to Colleen, but uh, the, uh, the concepts here. But I heard these things echoed through many conversations I had with people. So the idea here is that on the, and the question is sort of should this be an approach going forward? This is a different way, I think, than we predominantly deliver recreation services today. First on the, on the far left there, you have what's the age of the youth? This is particularly targeted towards youth, but you could think about it related to other portions of the population, but I, I think it most applies to youth programming. So, and, and so then in general, you have the idea that as kids get older, right, um, maybe the breakdowns of 0 to 7, 7 to 14, 14 to 18, 18 to 23 aren't exactly right, but the concept is that kids get older and that their level of involvement in program delivery can vary. And that the, the key thing is here that the kids are actually engaged in delivery of the program or some portion of delivery of the program. And that so at the very youngest age, you might have someone who's, who's kid considered a camper, then senior camper, junior counselor, and counselor. Are those breakdowns exactly right? Not sure. But you get the general concept that as you get older, kids have a capacity not only to receive service but to, to deliver service as well and that they might have actually be delivering service that they learned about um, in previous years. So that's the, kind of the first concept. And then the second is that, that the, the programs, um, they're, they're programs that play the community skills, strengths, assets, and they, they build life skills and job readiness um, within the, the program. So I, and this actually takes a lot of work. Um, I think to really assess what the needs are and what the community strengths are. I put down two simple examples here. Um, one is around aquatics, right? So you can imagine very youngest age kids have swim lessons. Um, as they get older, they, they uh, engage in swim lessons, but also a team competition. Maybe they begin to be ju junior lifeguards. As they get older, they continue in the team competition and they assist in teaching and they, full, you know, they do full lifeguard training. And as they're actually counselors, they're teaching swimming, teaching lifeguarding, and actually being lifeguards uh, within the Tacoma Park Aquatics Facility or around the uh, county. Um, and so there's this progression of learning a tangible skill that they might not do for their whole life. It doesn't mean they're going to be a lifeguard for their whole life, but that they learn key skills that are applied to all jobs around responsibility and um, being on time and being engaged and being able to teach people and um, being passionate about something. Um, and they might do that when they're in high school or college as a job, and then, you know, they might not do it later on when they're once they've graduated from college. Another example is around organic food. So clearly, there's a strong organic food movement in Tacoma Park. There's opportunities, more places we could plant vegetables and and other uh, foods. We could even have, uh, you know, some people already have chickens and pigs in their backyard. You could have more of that. Um, and that depending on the age, again, that Kids, you know, at the early on, they help plant, they water, maybe they, they tend, they do some activities to learn more about this at an early age. Um, then as se senior campers, they start to do food prep and take some cooking classes. Then as junior counselors, they're actually teaching kids, working in a commercial kitchen. Um, and then lastly, the, you know, the counselors are really teaching and totally running the commercial kitchen. 
you can imagine other things around video production um, in, the, in the great facilities we have here and uh, this auditorium and, and the, the, the need for greater programming on the cable channel. Those are just ideas. Those are just examples, illustrative examples. Those aren't to say that the council is trying to be prescriptive about those three examples or that's the programming that should happen, but more that to say that um, we have assets, we need to figure out what those assets are, and we need to figure out what the community needs are, and we need to marry them up in um, really high quality super programming that combines all these things together. Now, what would be different about that integrated approach? So I, I think one thing to acknowledge is that this is hard. Um, it takes a lot of well thought out in interconnectedness and rigor, and it's hard to find the win-win-wins. And I think the, you know, the thing to think about related to that is, can we find a recreation director that has experience in this model or understands this model in theory? Another thing to realize is that there's probably going to be a regular amount of attrition uh, in the, at the junior staff level or the part-time staff level. If you go back to this, it only sort of works if there's a flow through of the program, right? You don't have people who are counselors in their 40s running um, the aquatics program or, or in their 50s. Yes, there needs to be some ad older adult supervising the programming that, that, that's running, but um, the teachers, the people who are teaching swimming or lifeguarding are probably going to need to be... Um, uh, college students and then there's a turnover there so that the people who are junior counselors have an opportunity to move up. Uh, it probably acknowledges that there's probably more part-time and summer employees to give people more opportunities to be engaged in service delivery. And that's to be critical, to be, to be clear, that's not a tool for the city to pay less than full-time staff. I think in the past we've had a policy decision where we didn't, we wanted to limit um, part-time staff because we didn't want to um, purposely reduce costs based on giving people part-time jobs, this would be a different approach. This would say there's a specific ob objective with people having um, less than full-time employment because they actually might be going to college while they're being a counselor or they just may work here during the summer. Um, hopefully the quality of programming would be so good that everyone would want to be in the programming. That regardless of the demographic of where you are in the city, that you'd get a real integrated and, and mixed group of people in those programs. And then things like special trips to amusement parks would not be a program on their own. What would be would be occasional, um, you know, once a summer type of fun excursion. So those are some of the things you can imagine might be different. And there's probably more discussion to be had about this. What population of people slash residents should recreation be focused on serving? And this came out pretty clear in the discussion with um, with you all that really we wanted to focus on youth. So people up into their early 20s and on older Americans. And that wasn't to say we weren't going to do anything with people between 24 and 60, but it just wasn't going to be the focus. We have limited resources. If we have to choose where we're going to focus our resources, have the majority of our programming, that it's going to be in the, on the barbells here. It kind of creates this barbell picture. Um, and that also that we really do want to make sure that there's a focus on those with fewer opportunities and options, but that that still should be done in such a way that program is integrated and inclusive. It's not about setting up special programs for specific people on their own, but delivering such high-quality programming that everybody wants to come to it. Should there be a greater engagement of use of volunteers from the community? I think universally everybody said they, all the council members, had an interest in having a stronger desire to utilize volunteers. Um, there might have been varying degrees of how much that meant from, uh, no one was quite at, we should run the recreation department totally on volunteers, but very heavy engagement to, yes, we need more engagement. Um, we realized that the use of volunteers is not without work, so there needs to be structures and boundaries. Um, and we'd like to discuss further whether, whether a volunteer coordinator idea might make sense. Again, we wouldn't be prescriptive. I think that's ultimately a decision for the, the, uh, the staff to make about whether that's the best way to, 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 um, to coordinate the volunteers. But if we want more volunteers, we do need to think about what the boundaries are. And then lastly, that there does seem to be uh, you know, a professionalization in the department over the past few years, which is good. But also, we wanted to make sure that that wasn't, um, didn't sacrifice the involvement and engagement of volunteers. Um, and that councils, the council may be a little more comfortable with less bureaucracy and recreation, that there might be a little bit um, uh, 
more comfort with uh, a low level of chaos, shall we say. Um, now, should recreation expand its mission into social services? I would say it depends on what your definition of social services is. A lot of the discussions and interviews had to do with uh, as much as saying what we're not going to do as to what we are going to do. But most, most, the majority of us didn't feel that we um, had the the um, ability to expand into traditional, so into the traditional social services. They viewed this as the county function, not something that Tacoma Park has the resources, staff, or expertise to take on. Recreation Council wants recreation to stick more with athletics, arts, educational activities, um, and and uh, make sure that these are are done very well, and that they, when done well, they naturally teach um, youth needed life skills. But it wasn't seen that we wanted to do a lot of job training, resume writing, job search assistance, counseling, or standalone life skill classes. What should the structure of scholarship efforts be? So this council definitely had a strong desire to lean towards making scholarships easy to get uh, with the realization that there will be limits on enforcement. So make scholarships sort of requests on the honor system. The vast majority of people would abide by it, and any that slip through the cracks are worth it because it's less costly than a means-tested process, and generally more people would get access. Um, also the idea that if programs are super high quality, people may actually be willing to pay more, the people who can afford to. And, and therefore you can subsidize with even greater scholarship. We realize that there needs to be a conversation about the total amount of scholarship and we have to think hard about the budget um, and would that cause any cost increases. Um, and there were, th the last point is was, um, I can't remember if it was exactly, but it was sort of four to three. It wasn't a clear cut, you know, vast majority, uh, significant majority, but this concern about a big difference in non-city residents versus city residents. And you know, some people really feeling like, hey, the, the city residents pay more in taxes and there should be a clear way that they can say, hey, I, I'm, this is what I get for my higher taxes. Um, and so there are some council, -like, council members like that, but other council members who definitely felt like if we make a very drastic distinction that um, we could potentially cut down on some of the diversity, particularly in, in a lot of the sports programs that where people from the larger Silver Spring Tacoma area come. So that's a trade-off we need to think about. Um, what would program level and performance-based budgeting be helpful to recreation? Generally, council did want to know what it costs to run each program and what is delivered for that program in kind of hard numbers, number of participants, number of program hours, program quality, whatever the good measures of uh, of what a program is delivering. Again, those are illustrative. They're not to be prescriptive. Um, that would allow us to understand bang for the buck and help with discussion of which programs are the most effective. Should Recreation Department change its name to reflect the range of activities? It seemed to me that council wasn't, uh, was not sure that this was necessary, but open to having the discussion. So those are the, the main issues. I'm happy to run the presentation back if people want to talk about individual items, but I'm going to come back up there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Councilmember Wright, for uh, taking the uh, time and the uh, effort to uh, talk to each of us and try and pull together uh, what we were talking about. I think a uh, combination of the uh, efforts of the Recreation Committee and uh, the council in trying to uh, move this forward and come up with some clarity. I think we've got some some real good ideas to work with here, and I think uh, we have a fair amount of uh, matching of the the message from both your presentation and from yours. I um, want to check with my colleagues to see uh, if other people want to make some comments. Also, just a reminder that we have been on this for now about, well, more than 50 minutes, and we have a large chunk of time set aside next week as well to continue this discussion. So, you know, we need to say some things tonight, but we don't need to exhaust ourselves. We've got more opportunities in the immediate future to continue this discussion, and we have another discussion that we need to do this evening. So, Council Member Clay. Um, I want to thank Council Member Wright for taking the time to interview everyone and um, put all that all those thoughts together and uh, not only 
articulate them very clearly, but put it in a PowerPoint presentation with graphs. Um, and and I, you know the visual helps some people. We really hope that um, this will help communicate to the staff what it is that we're looking for. Um, I don't know how the other council members feel, but I I feel like that reflects my thoughts about where the recreation department should go, and I and um, and if it's if it's the case that 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 represents the majority opinion of all the council members, I'm really pleased. Um, I just want to hit on a couple of points. Um, I'm one of those council members, and I think this is really um, strongly reflected by my constituents that feel that people who don't live in the city should pay the costs of the um, recreation services, and people who live in the county but don't live in the city should pay the costs of the staff programming portion of the recreation department since the county has uh, at various times helped fund some of the costs of the um, infrastructure that are related to that and um, that we should focus our scholarships on folks who are Tacoma Park residents. Um, and the one comment I have about the barbell graph is that I also agree with that and that we spend our resources on each end of the barbell, but I want to exclude adult programming. Um, I just think that adult programming should should pay for itself. Um, people tell me that they've enjoyed the support that they get from the um, around the sports leagues, playing the adult softball and different things that get some help from my uh, and I, again, this is the issue even as a council member. I don't always know entirely what are different pieces, but I, but I understand that the city staff do provide support. Because I know I saw Eric out with the team for the, for the softball league. I don't know if it's fast pitch or slow pitch or what it was, but they're out there hitting the ball around. Um, and so I definitely would like to see those things uh, continue with those resources, and I appreciate that. And I just want to echo the fact that... Um, I know I'm not, and I don't hear people say that they're they're unhappy with the recreation department staff. And I frequently see people, you know, come to the meetings. They're concerned about the conversations, but um, uh, we want to move forward together with everybody. And I, I never hear anything but support for innovation and activities in the in the recreation department. So thank you. And before I go to Council Member Snipper, I just want to add a quick comment that I think is a nuance to uh, one point that Council Member Clay made, uh, and that's in the differential on the uh, resident and non-resident uh, charges. In the abstract, I agree with you that uh, city residents should pay less than non-city residents, either county or uh, maybe even not county, but the, the thing that gives me pause is the recognition that uh, in the particular example of like youth sports teams or those ki kinds of things, maybe where you're looking at where kids go to school and a lot of their school colleagues are not in the city but in East Silver Spring, that uh, there's a lot of kind of natural affinity for keeping those kids together in programs, that's where their friends are, they want to do things together, and that uh, I feel like there's there's a way to kind of recognize that and not have the monetary split that can change that. So I agree with you in concept, but I'm aware that uh, it doesn't necessarily play out that way uh, as well when, you get, when you're dealing particularly with some of the kids, I'll say, in kind of uh, middle elementary and middle school range, my sense is that that's different. So I just wanted to add that comment there. Council Member Snipper and then Council Member Siemens. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, too, want to uh, thank Josh. I, I thought he did a terrific job both in conducting interviews, uh, making us feel um, able to share our thoughts sometimes um, when we disagreed with our fellow council members in particular. Um, he made us comfortable that our uh, comments would be, you know, anonymous, so it wouldn't feel like uh, we were criticizing each other. 
Um, I also thought he did a great job um, putting the thoughts together in a very cohesive um, uh, way. Um, and I do want to emphasize something that um, uh, Josh and I discussed, that although it may not sound like it when we're talking uh, up here as a council um, and recreation staff are sitting in the audience or watching us, um, this isn't a... Our comments are not criticisms of recreation staff. It's uh, a shift in vision of where we want recreation to go. You know, it's staff do their jobs. You know, they follow the the directions that have been set up. And um, you know, I happen to think they do a terrific job. It's just we think there are some new directions that would improve things. The second thing I want to say about uh, a sort of a general comment is um, I feel really strongly, <laughs> and it's in the strategic plan, so we're supposed to do it, uh, that um, the council needs to uh, examine every department in the city in the same way we spend all this time on recreation. Um, some departments we may be more satisfied with or whatever, or we may have no ideas for how to improve, but there needs to be some rotating quality where we spend a little time on every department. And the idea behind that is to um, allow citizens as well as the council to suggest new directions um, somewhat the same way that happened tonight. Um, the Recreation Committee has come up with some, I think, really interesting ideas. And uh, Josh has put together some really interesting ideas with tremendous progress. But I think this kind of uh, process where we take a little time to examine each department would really be a benefit. In, ad in addition, it would de-emphasize, if you will, this kind of excess, I think, excessive focus on, on recreation month after month, year after year, because there are things we'd like to do differently in each of the departments. And because we focus so much time on recreation, we don't get to do that. So that's something I hope um, we can do. And my only, um, I, I happen to agree with um, Colleen um, uh, on the two issues she raised that there needs to be a, a differential between uh, residents and non-residents. Um, agnostic, I'm agnostic about whether they're Montgomery County or not Montgomery County. Um, but I do think uh, in it, what Bruce said is very important that um, this doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule, you know, a fixed percentage for each recreation program or activity. I think it needs to be uh, recognized that uh, certain kinds, as, as was indicated by Bruce, certain kinds of sports programs are just going to work better if we get, um, you know, kids from Rolling Terrace is the classic example. A lot of kids in my ward go to Rolling Terrace. Rolling Terrace is not located in Tacoma Park. There's a lot of Silver Spring residents who attend it. Um, we have many friends there. It would be really unfortunate if those folks those kids didn't participate with their classmates. And there may be um, other examples as well. And I agree with uh, Colleen that um, most types of adults, adult programs should be, um, the, the target should be um, that they more or less pay for themselves in some, you know, approximate version of that. Um, of course, with uh, the scholarship which was raised, we need a scholarship structure for those people who can't. Um, and this, uh, in order to do this um, kind of thing where you have to know what the costs are, I come back to uh, one of the other things that Josh said, which is the need for um, having some method to uh, parcel out what each program costs, how many people they serve, um, each program or function, and then some uh, evaluative thing of that program, is it working well, whether that's done by the people who participate or others, so that we can say, okay, this particular program or activity um, is working well and we're spending X dollars on it, seems like the right balance. This other program over here, we're spending Y dollars and people aren't all that satisfied, let's do something with it. It'll help us 
focus on where we want to do more and where we want to do less. And I'll stop. Thanks. Councilmember Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I would also like to express my appreciation to my colleague on the council, uh, Josh Wright. Um, he has done something that is incredible in my estimation to be able to bring focus to what the council has said. Um, some of we see very seldom. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I agree with Councilmember Snipper that uh, this is something I'd like to see us do more in all the departments uh, and all of the work that we do here at the Council. I think, uh, and we're working in that direction, uh, trying to be more directive of the Council Advisory Committees. And, uh, and then I think it's also going to be beneficial when we see the results here with the uh, Recreation Department to. Uh, consider how we can apply that same uh, approach to other departments. Um, I think it'll be it will help certainly help staff to understand what the uh, council is thinking about. But I, I think it also uh, is a big help to the council in in focusing what we are thinking about, uh, and rather than each of us uh, express our discomfort uh, with what's going on. We're we're actually sitting down and developing a plan for what we want to see. So I, I uh, have full confidence that we're going to continue doing this uh, into the, the next term. Um, you know, as with the uh, the recreation uh, committee's recommendations, I think uh, the recommendations that this council put together um, and summarized by Mr. Wright, um, I think, provide a lot of uh, of clarity on. Uh, what we want from the recreation department. I think, um, you know, there's very little in there that I will uh, disagree with and, and will work towards uh, maybe uh, getting some flexibility there. I think the, the life skills that are very important um, and in my ward, and I think other sections of Tacoma Park, it may not be a, a across the entire city, just as some of the other programs are not necessarily of uh, as much interest in, in Ward 4. So I think, uh, you know, we can continue to talk about that. But I think uh, as far as where we are now and where we move uh, in next week in our discussion, I think what we, uh, I think we need to uh, develop a policy statement that uh, clearly articulates which of these things uh, we want to see in the department. I happen to feel that, that uh, setting those as goals uh, would be helpful um, so that the uh, new recreation director has uh, at least some kind of a road map when he's considering the job uh, here in Tacoma Park. And that doesn't mean that it's the uh, end all to deciding what we want, but I think it, um, it's a good starting point uh, for moving forward. And um, then I would, uh, would say that the um, uh, Council Member Wright had a couple of example columns there of, of types of, uh, I think he had aquatics programs and organic food programs. And I think a, another kind of branch down there that I see, uh, because of the community we live in, I think there's an arts uh, what do you call it? Uh, scenario, anyways, that uh, would be equally uh, applicable. And that's it. Councilmember Robinson. I have a clar uh, clarification on the other local communities. I wonder if you could address Greenbelt. I see that you discarded it because the institutional and funding setting is different from, the, I guess, the county. But how about the programs? Because we went over there on a, on a field trip and we were kind of impressed. And can you say a couple words about what you saw or what you know about the Greenbelt programs? That's great. <laughs> I mean, anything other than maybe a little more than just great, like but substantive things that are comparative? I, I think one of the problems is that Greenbelt is much more inclusive. Uh, the, the city government of Greenbelt is makes up for the lack of effective county government and has a longer tradition. And so we felt they weren't exactly comparable because they do more. They're expected to do more. People expect them to do more. 
uh, and uh, we saw our, that's why we looked at Rockville and Gaithersburg, because they are in the context of Montgomery County and, uh, uh, you know, a well-developed recreation program in Montgomery County, et cetera, et cetera. So Greenbelt is very uh, attractive uh, program, um, but we did not really uh, actively uh, compare it, consider it. We, we've been there. We, we all knew what they did. We'd love to do similar things, uh, but we, were, we really weren't focused on that. Okay. I'm, I, all right. I mean, I'll, I, I, that's the decision you made, and it's clear. But it's funny. It's um, it's funny that that's the place you'd like us most to be, but you didn't want to consider it because you, you see what I'm saying. It's a little bit. It's a kind of a paradox or an irony or something like that. But thank you for clarifying. Okay. Um, I think we can. May I? Yes. I just for the discussion next week. I don't know if there's any requests or preparation that you want of any information from staff. One of the things, just since I won't be here next week, nor will Barb, um, I just wanted to mention one thing that was of interest in some of your discussion. It would be interesting to hear um, kind of how you might want to go forward. And that is when you talk about paying for the programs, and you know, you're talking about you know, should the residential versus non-residential. One of the points that um, I do know is that many of the adult programs um, pay way more than their cost, so they subsidize the, the youth and senior programs. So, so part of that mix sometimes is where you get revenue. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, we're not prepared to, to provide all that information now. It sounds, you know, it's clearly something that you will want to see when you look at the individual programs at a later time. But just as you think about that mix, I mean, rather than tax dollars, much of the subsidy does come from, from some of the adult programs. Okay. I, I think that type of observation would be very helpful to have. Uh, there was another one I'm think, I was thinking of, and I can't remember. Oh, um, maybe some simple observations like uh, Council Member Wright had the kind of the definition of seniors as, as 60. And, you know, if, if somebody were to say, oh, well, you should know that uh, the, the city has has has, reg has regularly assumed because of X Y Z that it's 55 or you know whatever it might be just a couple bits of information like that that are some fairly simple observations from anything that has come up either with the recreation committee uh, report or the uh, summarization of where the council was might just be helpful so that we don't go forward kind of working with certain assumptions just because they were convenient where it's helpful to know that. Uh, Cer certain decisions or uh, points have been made because of some some very important uh, inputs. If there's a couple items like that, we'll do that. we don't want to skip no, the discussion, but right, if there's no, a couple clarifying just a, a points. A couple of things to throw in there to say it would be helpful if you understand these couple of points. Senior is not 60. Thank you. Sorry, what did you say? <laughs> I think, you know, our, our senior computer room starts at 50, which, you know. Right. Right. So I know there are different definitions of senior. People often like now like the term older American. It's a broader term. Right. Experienced Americans. Experienced Americans. Experienced <laughs> citizens. Or just, I won't go there. <laughs> uh, Council Member Wright, uh, Robinson. Um, the, the, one, of, one of Josh's points was kind of pro programmatic reporting and I think that your notion of what pays for what is sort of like programmatic reporting. Right, we've so presented that in the past, but, yeah. but certainly it's a very useful thing That's when helpful. you look at the mix. Yeah, it, it, could, it could be just a reissue of a couple of pages. And um, I'll come back to Greenbelt for a moment. <laughs> Our rec committee didn't, didn't look at Greenbelt, mm -hmm. but if, so they seem to think that it's a good model. If there are, are any tidbits about how the Greenbelt rec uh, department delivers its services that you want to share with us. I would certainly be interested in seeing that. Okay. Councilmember Clay. Um, so I just want to be clear that, that I'm not looking to ado abolish adult programming. <laughs> um, wasn't what I what I intended to communicate. Um, I think that we should do adult programming that pays for itself. Um, I think an example of of programming that I would question would be the uh, the trip to Gettysburg to go to the 
build a bear workshop. Um, so, um, you know, I know enough about recreation programming that I can run the numbers on that in my head, and that was not um, a, the kind of a program that, that paid for itself after you ended up paying the overhead costs and the, the cost of the driver and the staff support and, and given the charges that there were. That, that's, that's all that we're saying, or that's all that I'm saying. I don't speak for myself. Um, we have to provide programming for adults as well. I think we just focus. We should focus our subsidies and um, uh, looking at areas where we're going to provide extra support. Looking at uh, putting more of our assets into the um, youth programming, senior programming, programming for people with uh, with higher needs. Essentially, um, that was that was what I was trying to say. The other thing that I wanted to um, say, and I, I should have said this while the Recreation Committee was still up, but um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at all at any of the pieces about the Cities of Service or the, or the uh, Cities of Service uh, movement. There are um, cities all across the country. I think there's maybe there's 200 of them now that have declared Cities of Service, and they have a Chief Service Officer in the cities. Um, it's it's been a lot of larger cities that have been able to afford to do this, and they've gotten grants uh, to hire their chief service officers. But there's a new program now um, that I think is in part funded by Mayor Bloomberg from New York, but he's funded um, some different communities um, to have a two-year grant to, to have a chief service officer. They're also doing a partnership <coughs> with AARP where they're looking for volunteers to be a volunteer chief service officer. So. Um, and the AARP folks are helping to identify senior leaders in the community that would help um, stand up a, a cities of service program within the community. And, and it's all, it all relates back to the same group of people from Be the Change and Service Nation, all those groups, that, and Kaboom, um, and the, the Playful Cities activities. And it would be great for us to um, get to be a part of that. Well, just one quick note is Howard noted that at um, Festival. Can you come to the Sorry. Howard Cohn noted at the festival that one of the AmeriCorps volunteers was a kid that came up through the Tacoma Park Soccer League. And just kind of, you kind of see that coming back into the system. But the program you speak about, is it working with just, with seniors to kind of? The Cities of Service program yeah. itself? No, the Cities of, you go to citiesofservice.org. Okay. It's a nationwide program of, of, um, Cities that are uh, prioritizing community service and volunteerism and support for volunteerism in their in their communities. Um, uh, so it's it's Cory Booker. It's um, it's the name of the woman who just got elected the mayor of Houston, Bruce. Oh, Anise Parker. Anise yeah. Parker. She's been mayor for four years. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, you know, I'm getting old. The times getting yep. compressed. Yep. Um, but <laughs> mayors all across the the, the community, Memphis. Mm -hmm. Um, all over uh, that are prioritizing service and looking at how to uh, integrate in a greater way volunteerism and community service into their into okay. their communities and into their into their cities. And so they have a structure, they have resources, they have toolkits. Um, there's been the grant funding that has gone through. I think they're in the second phase of the grant funding. And this AARP thing is new, and it's really designed for smaller communities um, that maybe can't afford you know full time. Uh, service person and look to see if they can do that in a two-year commitment with uh, volunteers. Great. Well, look into that. I mean, I know the the rec department has been using some volunteers with the service learning hours and, um, and some of that. So that's certainly an area I think we could expand upon. But uh, great, thanks. Okay, and Council Member Wright, and I think I'll give you final word. Uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate this comment about the barbell graph. It is it is really about how we focus our resource and effort. So it's not to say that we wouldn't do use, uh, adult programming, but that it wouldn't be the focus and that, that we wouldn't um, spend a lot of dollars on it. Um, to me, I'm kind of want to hear from the council about like what we want, the what's the next takeaway, what do they want to react to. I have to fly back and forth to LA between now and Friday. So I could take the presentation and the recreation committee's information and put it into a Word document, which used some of the graphics and tried to explain it and then people would be able to edit and react to that. Would that be helpful? Is that a good next step? Or sure. do we want to just start the conversation, you know, just have the conversation based on what we have so far next Monday? You want to take a crack at turning that into goals? 
uh, you want a goal section in there, that's part of what you want. Yeah. I'm happy to to add that in there. I think it's going to be a little bit challenging, but yeah, yeah, I think we need to talk a little bit. I, I would put the goals as kind of a uh, space holder in there because I don't quite know. Um, I don't think we've talked enough about it. Or I haven't heard enough from individuals. But, but if you but if you put the um, the information you have in the form of goals, that would be a helpful starting place for that discussion. Um, I, I don't think that there's a long plane ride from here out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Um, I, yes, it is. I, I don't think um, that uh, goals is the only thing that needs to go into there. Okay. So why don't I think about it and see if I if I lightning strikes me related to what we have so far related to goals, I'll put something in there specific. If not, then and, and if you happen to uh, get the ability to uh, go wireless while you're in the air and you need feedback, you can always. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And we will continue this discussion next week. We'll take a short break and we'll come back for our final agenda item. now at our last agenda item for the evening, which is a discussion of sidewalk installation policy. Uh, and does the deputy city manager want to introduce this one? Oh, sure. Um, Daryl and I were here with you on January 1st for two hours until a quarter of midnight. We promise not to keep you that late this evening. Appreciate it. Um, and so we took notes during the time. I also had to go back and look at the, <laughs> at the end of that discussion to make sure that our notes were, were accurate. And there were a few changes even in, during that discussion about some of these um, uh, provisions. So um, this is our best take at what we took away from the discussion on July 25th. And we've asked um, that you review it and see if it is what you had in mind. And we have several questions. What this um, shows is based, is based on uh, Councilmember Clay's proposal that there's a two-step process. There's a process for initiating planning for new sidewalks. Um, and then where basically you try to decide should a sidewalk be built in this area. Um, and then there's a, basically a possibility of a vote to see if indeed within a certain area where you think there should be a sidewalk or if there were a sidewalk where that connection should be. Um, if that seems to go forward, then it goes to a design phase. Um, and in the design phase, there's a lot of more detailed work. Uh, resulting then in another vote, this time of the people who would be immediately affected by the installation of a new sidewalk on that side of the street. Um, and then the sidewalks would be constructed if that was uh, seen to be the, the opinion. There were several questions that we had, um, and it seemed in the discussion that the city staff had some leeway about kind of determining the affected area or certainly the run of the sidewalk, which would be what would be the minimum needed to make an adequate connection that would not then set up a violation of the ADA or something by having a gap. Um, and then we as city staff would do, it's considered a vote or a survey process. Um, the what we believe we heard was that kind of only affirmative votes of households count and that you would need a majority. One of the, in part of the discussion, it was stated a 50%, another, it was stated 51%. We decided that it would be really confusing to have one thing be 50% and one thing be 51%. So 
I just kind of unilaterally put them both at 50 percent. <laughs> um, and um, we ended up with a series of questions that we hope that you will have reviewed this proposal and kind of start addressing the questions. I don't Daryl, were there anything else? Um, so I think I, I'd rather just throw this open unless you want me to go through what each of, kind of the details, read the details of each of these stages. Daryl, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, and I guess one other point, and that is that uh, certainly Councilmember Schultz, by being kind of further along on a sidewalk process, has some particular interests of his own about what we should be proceeding with for the Ward 6 sidewalks. Okay. Um, maybe if we can just get a few quick clarifications out of the way first, and then I'll go to my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> In all of this, you're, ref you're assuming that the percentages apply to the respondents as opposed to the universe of, in the question? That's right. That's what was discussed with the, by okay. the council at the, okay. on July 25th. And so the concept was you had to basically say, yes, you wanted it to show that you're clearly of interest. You're clearly interested in it. No, but, it, but in terms of determining percentages, we we're, ta would, we're we talking would, about respondents? We would, we would count the number of households, and so you would need to get 50% of, of the number the, of households. Of, of, the, of the total number of households or um, the responding right. households? That's one of the questions. That's one of the questions, but because it wasn't clear to us if people didn't respond to the survey, were they to be counted at all, or they to be counted in the negative, or they to be not counting? That, that's something for the council policy-wise to decide. Um, given our past experience with surveys, we know that we're going to have a high percentage of non-respondents, not from opposition or support, just non-response. Right. And, right. And, and, and I, you know, we were imagining a run that affects six, six households, and two of them want it, and four of them say, I don't care either way. What do we do? You know. Well, but, but if they say, I don't care, that's different than you don't hear anything. That's part of the direction we'd like from you. Do we want to deal with that one, or do you want to go to broader questions? Well, this is a broad question. Okay. Okay. So let's 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 discuss that one. One way to deal with that is um, if they respond, is it, and they say, "I don't care either way." It's it's like an N A. It's not a yes or a no. So we can ignore them and just compare yeses and nos. To one option. Other. Thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think the um, that what we're looking for is an affirmative for a percentage of the uh, properties on the on this portion of the street um, that's in consideration. So I think that uh, that it is that your that your yeses have to be um, a percentage of the total. Of the, of the, of the, of the, of the total universe as opposed to the respondents. Right, because I think when you don't have the uh, respondents, um, that means that, that you're, you're not doing the outreach. I think on an issue like this, I think there are some issues where people just say, eh, I don't care. But I think uh, this type of an issue, that if you're not getting respondents, then you're not getting the message out. And so I think everybody on the street should be um, included in the total. Yeah. So, but if, but if, there's, if there are ten houses and ten people respond and, and three of them say yes and three of them say no and uh, four of them say I don't care, how, did, how, would, you, how would you say? They, everybody votes, but four say I don't care. I, well, let's I, say if there's, I, I let's address say there's, this when I, when I yeah. propose okay. this. Okay, so do you want to... Sure. What I said when I proposed this was that you know, this is the reason why it would be an affirm it would be an affirmative piece. So it's not collecting petitions against the sidewalks, but it's just affirmative. So if there are ten households, you need five signatures. Five yeses. So, five so, yeses. Similar to the speed hump process. Right. And that same concept. And so even in a situation where there's five houses and a twelve unit apartment building. How would you count that? We didn't discuss that specifically, but 
You said it, you had said you clarified that it was household, so that's how we used it. Which right, I counted as household. So you but paid I mean, property, 12 units plus the five households. But as a property said. owner, also should have a say in there. I disagree with that. I think we count residents. Right. So residents are house, household, household units. I, I think we count the households, but the people who actually reside right. in so the in the community. So if there's a five a unit apartment building that would be five households. That would be five households. I agree with that. So the uh, individual who owns the property on which uh, an easement may be taken uh, does not have a say in it? There's no easement taken for the sidewalks. Because it's in the public right away. It's in the public right away. It would be in front of the building. Property. In every case? Well, so far we've been designing with an existing public yeah. right away. There may be a case where it's not. Well, I, I know that, you know, from my experience in Ward 4, there have been a number of uh, uh, places where there is not an easement. Uh, there's no public right, right away. away. There's no public, there's a public mm -hmm. right away in the street, but certainly when they put in sidewalks, I didn't consider putting the sidewalks in the street. They, um, they got easements on the properties. Right, on which end? Right. And have we changed how we are looking at that or we would go through that same? I'm not familiar with any easement process for sidewalk that was before my time, I guess. So I'm, I'm not aware of the city undertaking that for a sidewalk construction. But it, I imagine there may be a case where public right away, like we know on Trower Avenue, goes all the way to the curb. So we're going to have situations where we have to work out um, an arrangement with the property owner to use their property. So if you, if you have to get an easement, you're ne either you're negotiating with the property owner or you're using eminent domain, I don't think, uh, I haven't heard people in Tacoma Park on this city council expressing a lot of support for having an eminent domain battle. I think once you're talking about somebody's private property, you're negotiating with them anyway. And I don't think it's going to come across as an issue because we're talking about public right-of-way. And we got years of building in the public right-of-way before we start spending money buying right-of-way unless, you know, the people want to. No, I think we should think defer that discussion about easements and, and work on the for the purposes of tonight's discussion, the assumption that whatever sidewalks we're going to be building are going to be on the public right away. Right. But that's a that's a gross assumption and I think no, it's uh, not. we don't I think have to decide could. the issue tonight though, Terry. That's the point. I mean, it's a great issue to raise, but most of the work is going to be um, in places where we don't have that problem. But that's a, that is a basic assumption that I think is ill-founded. No. Ex okay, except that you, there's, there's nothing about creating a sidewalk policy now that subverts the property ownership rights of people who live in Tacoma Park. And so we don't have the authority to make a, a law that says that um, if 50 percent of the residents on a given street say that the community gets to take right. your land and stick a sidewalk across, that that doesn't hold any weight. We don't have the authority to, to do that. So we can't be talking in this policy about using the policy to take land. The t taking of land is, is, is litigated and is case law up through the um, Supreme Court for a hundred, you know, I, I mean, I know of a hundred years of, of law and I'm sure that it was before that, so. Um, maybe you were a senior citizen. Uh, maybe I am. <laughs> all, all, all we're, so it's, it's not possible for what we're designing now to have an effect such that 50% of the citizens on a given block could vote to take property from their fellow and, and, and my recollection of the discussion on the Richie Avenue sidewalk, where that, where the, where there was a question of needing to put it on uh, private property, was that it wasn't put there, and there's a gap in the sidewalk. Is that right? It happens to be the issue that got me first down here to my first council meeting, <laughs> uh, because uh, my father-in-law owned the property. 
and uh, there was no easement. He did not want to give an easement. And, and so he didn't, and we didn't. Uh, it turned out, in fact, I think Ms. Braithwaite was there, and we negotiated on the spot with, uh, when the sidewalk got to the, to the property line, we negotiated on the spot, and, and uh, the city made concessions, so we ended up with a sidewalk. If you'll notice that the sidewalk in front of our house is right out at the curb instead of um, leaving the uh, courtesy strip or whatever it is. For the, for the purposes of this discussion, if, why don't we limit it, at least for right now, for the areas where sidewalk construction is within the right-of-way. Did I, did I hear a majority that said that you want 50% of affirmative yeses of the total number of households in the, in the run? That's what I heard. Okay, I had a question on uh, the percentage. Uh, what's the percentage for speed bumps? 66. Doesn't it seem like we ought to be the same? No. Why not? Because speed bumps are um, have a more hyper local effect than sidewalks do. Sidewalks are part of the city's transportation infrastructure and they provide accessibility for all of the folks. Um, I think part of the trade off at 50% was. Do we design a, a, a citizen input process that acknowledges that it's a community infrastructure and allow lots of other folks to vote on it? Um, or do we find a way to kind of moderate between the, the fact that the sidewalk, although it's in the public right of way, is um, is you know localized on a street but it is for the value of everybody to use and so i think the trade-off is then should we if the, if the sidewalks for everyone to use should we let everyone in the community vote on whether or not we put a sidewalk in on a particular block well if we if we went with that thinking that it's part of the transportation infrastructure and then we let everybody affected vote on it and we get to a 68 percent vote we'd have sidewalks all over this all over the city on both sides of the street because the because the people who but you, you could make the same argument you could make the same argument for speed bumps that if we let everybody in the city vote no neighborhood would get speed bumps because everybody outside the neighborhood you know i'm certain that mr lovelace would not vote for speed humps on maple avenue on oh, the no. upper part and i'd be right there with him <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and the difference i'd see would be that uh, speed humps can essentially uh, be removed and there's an option to do that when you repave and sidewalks are more permanent and so there ought to be a higher hurdle but in this in this instance you need a more a majority to keep a sidewalk out that's right if it's 50 percent to put one in then it's 51 percent to keep it out that's right but and that's why i'm suggesting that 66 would be the right to keep it in or to put it in or to put it in to put it in so you're going the other direction. Well, I think we need to determine whether or not, as a council, we feel the installation of sidewalks in and of themselves is basically a good thing for the community or not. Because we can choose to say that we are utterly indifferent, and we don't really care, and if enough people want them, we'll put a sidewalk in on your block, like a speed bump, let's say, and if and and, uh, and we will be indifferent to it. But I don't think that that's our position, because I think sidewalks have to have continuity, particularly on certain streets, critical streets that lead to and from uh, nodes of uh, of activity. Uh, they provide a safety function for a whole set of people of different ages and needs. And continuity of sidewalks is important in some cases. Now, in other, on certain blocks within the city, continuity is just not relevant. Uh, and so, so that's uh, a more that's a more nuanced. Um, yeah. So you can say that they're not, they're not street. taking the position that we want sidewalks, though, right? Yeah. So it's, you're saying, it's, you're saying it's more nuanced than just us taking a position that we want sidewalks. Well, you? yeah, I mean, in certain certain important streets, I'll use Wildwood Drive as an example, 
It's a street that uh, is the spine for Ward 6, and it leads to uh, many services uh, and activities. Um, and if you're going to have a sidewalk on Wildwood, then it really doesn't make any sense but to have it all the way the length of the, of the street because if you interrupt it, then you're forcing people to walk a sidewalk and then walk into the street and then walk back onto the sidewalk and then walk off of the sidewalk. So, so are you saying that it on, uh, on, on a street like Bell, Bellwood? Well, Wildwood. Wildwood, yeah. Wildwood that, that this process would not apply? Yeah, well, I'm, try I'm trying to... I'm not trying to get to this particular conclusion. What I'm trying to s emphasize is that, as to what I'm trying to get to is to the question, as the city council, are, are, is the installation of sidewalks something that we consider to be for the general good of the community, or that we, or alternatively, we don't really care? No, but there's there is but you did acknowledge that it's more nuanced than that stark distinction. But if you're going to do a fifty percent vote of the people who are affected, that is what you're saying is is that the people who get to vote are the people whose next to which the, the, their property next to which a sidewalk is going to be built. Okay. But we're, we're also so talking about runs here, aren't we? And uh, are we making we're talking a about, I'm about talking runs? About sidewalks in general, runs and little little sections as well. But I, but but a run is in this instance more than one block, and you're trying to focus on one block. I'm not well, a clarification as to whether a run is more than one block, and if that's the way well, you can. Well, if you want to talk about it, talk about it. But I'm trying to talk about it well, with you right have now. My say. Well, I thought we were having a conversation. If you just have your say. Then we all have our say. We may be here a very long time. Councilmember Schultz, if you want to continue, and then we'll continue the discussion. Yeah, I'd like to continue. Um, when you have a sidewalk that, that has, it is a run and that it serves uh, a number of activities in the community, and then you give to the the vote to only to the people whose properties touch a sidewalk, whether it's the side of the house. Uh, or the front door of the house, then you're more or less giving them the power to decide on the installation of a service that all the people in the adjacent streets are going to want to make use of and would appreciate being able to have some say in the matter, such that if you're pushing a stroller or, a, or you're in a wheelchair or if you're an elderly person and doesn't feel comfortable walking, or if it's at night and you feel better, safer walking in the sidewalk in the dark in the winter time, uh, those would all be things that some people who don't live on that particular street might say, "This is really important to have because I have to use this sidewalk to get to where I want to go to." So I'm concerned in those situations about allowing the people who are just touching the sidewalk to have the say one way or the up, up or down to the exclusion of everybody else in the adjacent streets. I, I hear that. So can I respond? Please. Okay. Yes. Um, I think what I hear you saying, and I'll reiterate it, is that if, the, if in an instance where a run seems to be something of value to us as a city or to our, our sense of a plan where a three-block uh, sidewalk would be a good thing because it was linking... Uh, an area to a to a shopping area or a transportation hub. I think what I'm hearing you say, Fred, is that that's an instance where you'd like to see an override of sorts to this sort of process. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that was the clarification I was after. Yeah. I think that in the proposal, as we heard it, is that there would be an option for the council to um, identify an area that for particularly for particular safety or other connection reasons um, you felt it should move forward clearly in terms of identifying an area for the planning process to to begin that was identified in the discussion in July where Daryl and I weren't as clear as what happens when we get down to the design phase and into that final installation uh, where um, let's say the council feels that it's feels strongly that these two blocks connect 
for safety reasons or for other reasons make an important connection but the people whose homes about where the sidewalk would go vote against it you know what would you still want to have an override position as an option and and that wasn't clear in the discussion because it just seems to me that where we started this whole conversation was the council was interested in putting some sidewalks in yeah and responding to the requests for sidewalks from a number of residents or neighborhoods or streets and then trying to deal with okay there are certain there were certain areas who said no we don't we don't want them don't force them on us and this is a, a process of trying to make sure that we take into account some local wishes in doing this overall process of wanting sidewalks so I think we're getting kind of twisted up in the question here mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that the first paragraph here of the run is important, and that you put, you put that out there that the, the staff would say this section is important, and then let's consider it. And then there's these the details for right. And, and in terms of what a run is, I think that there is uh, my understanding of what a run is is the the smallest section that does the connection, kind of the essential connection that doesn't leave us hanging. That could mean it's a run on a block, and then it's a possibility you could cross the street at a crosswalk and go on the other side. And so I could see a section where you've got a street where there's three runs, you know, on three continuous blocks, and, but each of them individually could find another way at the intersections. And so you may need, you may have a section, you know, you may have three runs on the same street as part of a discussion, each one of which would be subject to that voting process. Or it may be that because of topography or something else, it's got to be a two-block section to make that work. And and so part of this would just be us going out there and, and identifying kind of what we felt that, that minimum connection uh, would be. Okay. Councilmember Clay and then Councilmember Siemens. I, I wanted to just say something on the record about the last piece and then answer the question about the run. So um, the reason why I started at 50% 50 50 initially is because um, um, speed bumps aren't a, a broad public good. They're something that just benefits the immediate block, um, the immediate affected block. And so kind of to override sort of the, the, what is essentially a localized issue that um, is actually a negative to the to the broader community. It requires that the local residents have to express essentially a super majority, and there's a reason to have actually a super majority in that in that smaller case. Um, sidewalks are a public amenity for the entire community, and that's why I thought a simple majority should be sufficient. Um, and it also allows a simple majority to um, stop the installation of the sidewalk. And I think that this is further reinforced because it's not just a simple majority of the respondents, but it's um, it's 50 percent of the households. And um, most residents who have communicated with me feel that that even 50 percent is is to get the signatures is probably a significant hurdle. The thing I'll say about the run is that the purpose of investing that with the the staff and making that decision is in addition to the topography issues and the funding issues is to make sure that we pick things that that don't run us afoul of the ADA requirement that you have connectivity because um, so you know you, there's there's people who want sidewalks but we've also said we're actually going to give a, a meaningful opportunity for representation to all the folks and so if you're on the other side of it and you're one of the people who, who doesn't really want sidewalks it wouldn't be fair to set up a process where, let's say, you had four sections of the block, and we did a we did it block by block, and we let this section vote, and we got 70% of the people who wanted a sidewalk, and then the next section voted, and 70% of the people didn't want a sidewalk, and we had 70% who do, and we had 70% who didn't, and so we installed sidewalks in the two places where we had a 70% majority, and then we come along and you know we get an, an opinion that says, hey you have to have connectivity and so you need to go back to those blocks that didn't 
70 percent of them didn't want to have a sidewalk, and you'd have to install it anyway. And, and we would have to do that because that's what the loss is. We're going to create the connectivity across there. And so to make it a meaningful community process, you have to have the conversation about the, the, the section that you essentially are committing to once you start to build a sidewalk. And that was the purpose of vesting that with the staff um, who either have now or would develop or and who stay on top of the issues around the law and the ADA and those pieces. Councilor Stevens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, there obviously are uh, many places in the city where we need sidewalks and that they'll be beneficial to the community. Um, I think the, uh, the real problem we face is that uh, we did this study, but it's really not a needs analysis. And that leaves us and, and really the future councils with the problems that we've had in the past with uh, other things, whether um, it becomes more arbitrary, more subjective on whether we want sidewalks in a given area or another. And I think a big part of the solution is um, to have that needs analysis, to take the work that has been done with the study that we have approved, but to carry it through with a needs analysis of what is the pedestrian traffic in an area and, um, and then use that as a criteria for where to put the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's similar to what uh, Councilmember Schultz was talking about, that there, uh, if you had that needs analysis and you had the, uh, uh, the numbers in front of you, then the argument goes away. It's much easier to, to support the uh, implementation and installation of sidewalks uh, where there is a clear need and it isn't just a subjective desire. Can I comment yes. on that? Just uh, And again, I totally understand what you're saying, Councilman Stevens. I would say, though, that what we have in front of you based on July 25th kind of sidesteps the tool design study and starts it from a new process and says there's three ways that you can get a sidewalk constructed regardless of what we had with tool design. It says community association can ask for it, city staff can ask for it, or um, city staff can see it in places where there isn't a neighborhood association and start the process. So what we're looking at now in this process that we started on July 25th was not using the, uh, the evaluation that was done with tool design uh, as, a, as a step from here forward. Um, to do a needs analysis such that you're, you're considering is an incredible amount of money. Um, and, and you do end up with a bit of a chicken and egg situation of uh, would people walk if the sidewalk was there versus, versus not. So in some ways, you can identify pedestrian generators and say, we rate these important, therefore this is an important, you know, this is going to check all the marks on a needs an assessment. But in other ways, uh, like it's the same situation we have the state highway all the time. Our pedestrian counts don't wait because people won't walk across the street there. It's it's life threatening. So we're never going to get the pedestrian numbers. It's a it's a constant chicken and egg situation. So you can take a look from a kind of a engineering design or evaluation or an actual counting, or you can let the community, based on their knowledge of the area, interest in the area, and the way they'd like to live and be in their neighborhood generate the process for establishing sidewalks. So the policy that we've started on doesn't look at tool design. It starts from square one with neighborhoods. Would you, are there instances where you as staff would like to look at tool design? Oh, well we have, and, and that's where we started this process based on the tool design and the tier one sidewalks when we started the process in Ward 6 and Ward 2. So we've, you know, we've got our feet wet through that process. Um, there seemed to be a lot of different opinions about whether or not it made sense to continue with that process or whether or not we needed to step back and come up with a more general understanding on the part of the council and the community as to how you could ask for a sidewalk and how a decision would be ultimately made. And so that's kind of the morass we find ourselves in now, trying to figure out how decisions get made. Yes, but as part of that morass, um, Daryl, uh, number one, the city identifies the installation of the new sidewalk as a priority. It seems to me that you could use the tool design to help we, you we, identify that priority. We have and we did so to safe routes to school. I mean, for the city staff 
portion of it. We have more sidewalks than we can build in the next decade. It's a priority. Already identified. So it comes down to prioritization. And if you're going to prioritize a certain run or section, you could. You're not. I don't think I hear you saying that you won't look at tool design. No, no, I'm just saying. You're looking at a new process. Is that right? That's what was generated from July 25th. Basically, to step us out of where we were with the tool design and the tier one, two, three, and get into a a different process. But you're not stepping completely out of tool design. What I think I heard you just say is that you you reserve the right to use tool design to help you set priorities, which is a reasonable thing. Well, that's right there. Hey, sure. The city staff have already identified primarily through Safe Routes to School where we think the priority areas are for sidewalks, and those have already been published and drawn on charts and maps. And right. So I was just trying. I was just trying to get clarity that you're. I don't. You're not saying. You're tossing out the tool design results. You're just saying there's another process in place that we're working on. Well, right? that's where we started again on July 25th with okay. a new process. And, and part of this is to address, you know, the interest of some neighborhoods who said, "Gee, when are you going to get to our area? We really want sidewalks. Sure. And how do we? And how do we put our?" voice out there. So, right. you know, it, it may be one of, you know, 250 segments in the of priority in the tool design study, and they're not sure when we'd ever get to them, but they're anxious about it, and so they had come to you to ask, gee, when can we, how can we get this moving? So I think mm -hmm. that was part of the reason that this got developed. Okay. Um, and one, one other point, too, is that sometimes until you see the design in front of you, you don't know if you like it or or it's workable, you, you know, or it's not workable. Sometimes part of this is just, you know, in general, you're nervous about a sidewalk going in front of your house, but then when you see it, it's like, well, yeah, that seems reasonable, or completely the opposite of point of view. And so part of this kind of lays out the process that people would get a chance to see that. Because it addresses the conundrum that there always is of, gee, why didn't you come to me sooner? Why did you come so soon when you don't have any details? Right. <laughs> and that's what this was attempting to address. Right. Um, and I've lost track of who wanted to speak, who had a leftover light from wanting to speak. I'm going to turn them all off and ask we'll you to the go next back. Item. And I know the council member right has the thing up against there, so I'll go to council member right first. Oh, I just want to say I'm I'm in agreement with this approach generally. I agree with the 50% rule. I do think that the council should have override that ultimately the community, you know, some number of people in the run, whether it's a block or two blocks, could say we don't want it, and we could say we think this is of such critical importance that we're gonna we're gonna override that and put it in anyway. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a balance there because. We're, we don't often do things when there's a bunch of people yelling at us in the council chamber. But you can imagine a situation where some kid who lived three blocks away got hit by a car, and we really, that was the third time it had happened or something like that, and we really felt like, hey, this is for the good of the community and safety. We're going to do it anyway, even though you're yelling at us. I think we or, or, or you could imagine, say, for instance, that for some reason there were no sidewalks on the 70 five, six, and seven hundred block of Maple Avenue, and it was impossible to get 50 percent of all of the residents in the multifamily units to say, yes, they wanted sidewalks, and we go, well, now what do we do? We don't have a majority, and we say it's critically important that we put these sidewalks in. We've got to do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Council Member Schultz, followed by Council Member Snipper. You know, one thing I think that uh, needs to be uh, said is that from my experience of what we've gone through in Ward 6 with the meetings is that an awful lot of importance needs to be uh, paid to the, to the process. We're, we're sort of preoccupied here, I guess, as we need to be about percentages and who gets to vote and all that. Uh, and what, um, but what, what, what I noticed is that when we've had Daryl come out to meetings, uh, and she's been e uh, capable of answering a lot of questions from a lot of um, skeptical people um, about sidewalks and provided answers, 
plain, simple, factual kind of pieces of information. And people have had a chance to think about that. And then they've had a chance to look at a drawing on the wall that gradually people's minds have changed. At least that's what's happened in, in, uh, in my ward. So I think the actual planning process, kind of like what Daryl is outlining here is uh, among the various ways by which sidewalk consideration would be initiated, be initiated is, is a good one. Because I think once people start coming to meetings, they start seeing 30% uh, drawings on the wall, uh, and they sort of say, well, what are you going to do here? And, oh, you're going to put a retaining wall there, and you're going to build that retaining wall. And on, on here, you're going to work around the street by going out into the street. But all of a sudden, they, f they feel listened to. They sort of say, oh, this, this act makes sense. And, and, and it becomes something ra uh, rather, an ideolog rather instead of an ideological battle to more of, a, of, of something that they can actually grasp and understand and sort of see the sense of it all. And, and, and that's sort of what's happened in Ward 6, is that by the time we got through all these meetings, for the most part, people uh, were quite satisfied with, 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 the, with the outcome, even though Wildwood Drive, uh, and there was a number of other streets that were, that were considered, it was a very long street, about eight or nine blocks long. And by the time we got to the end, and I realized there was one more meeting to be scheduled, uh, which we haven't yet had, to refine some last-minute suggestions, it worked out. And there, weren't, there, weren't, there were never any votes taken. They were on Erskine Street, but a different story, because some of the people said, wait a minute, I didn't know about the meetings, even though the Department of Public Works sent first-class mail and also distributed flyers to everybody's door, personally. Uh, and there was no vote taken. And why wasn't there a vote taken? Because we can't, this isn't right. So it doesn't guarantee an, a positive outcome in every, every case. But I think that the process itself can be very, very helpful to getting us to a point where we actually get to build sidewalks. That's where we're stuck. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I want to emphasize something that um, <laughs> seems to have gotten lost in the shuffle here. What we are talking about is a process that sets up a queue, that sets up a list, that sets up a priority. It isn't building sidewalks. Um, many members of this council have been opposed to spending very much money on sidewalks. So. Um, the amount of money we have in the budget for sidewalks um, uh, means that it's going to take years and years before folks who want sidewalks get them, just because the queue is so long, the list of sidewalks is so long. What we're trying to do is set up a bit of a priority for them, um, rather than, you know, actually giving residents the, you know, an actual vote on a sidewalk because the sidewalk is far, you know, could be 10 years later before the sidewalk gets built. Um, and by that time, maybe everybody's moved away or whatever, and, you know, the vote would be all different. But my point is <clears throat> it's a little different than the way the speed bump process works in which, um, you know, the speed bump is built relatively quickly. These sidewalks are going to take a long time before they're built. Um, the second thing is I think the point of having this um, somewhat involved process is uh, to do just what uh, Council Member Schultz said, is to uh, help people feel heard, to encourage debate and discussion about it um, as a way of making the process more informative, uh, because all of these steps will mean that uh, notices have to go out. Listeners will get the notices. There'll be community discussion. It'll take a period of time. It automatically means that there will be um, lots of time for people to be involved. I do think that um, ultimately the council should have the uh, authority to override what the community might say, although I do, do note I I've only been on the council for five years, 
<clears throat> but I don't remember. I lived in Tacoma Park many more years uh, before that. I don't remember a time when the council has either put in a speed bump or some similar thing when the community did not want it. Um, it's hard to imagine the case in which the council would, in fact, override the community, except in very unusual circumstances. So I suspect that the cases in which that happens will be very rare um, and um, are not sort of the primary focus of the policy. They need to be addressed, but I don't think they're the primary focus. That's it. Okay. Do we want to get back to the list of questions? It sounds like we're kind of back to the... I think we've, 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 we've kind of gotten off of the rocky road of do we want to head off in another direction. We're back on where we started, and we can get through this list. I don't know if you, in one sense, I'd like to skip number one, if we don't mind, and, and get to Ward 6 kind of after these other questions. Um, so in this, the question two was to clarify, and this is what I heard from you, that it's you're all right with the fact that people who are not in the immediate run area wouldn't be part of the survey for either the yeah, planning study correct. or for the design work unless the neighborhood association wanted to bring it up as a proposal for a planning study. It sounds like the neighborhood association doing it or the, or the staff initiation or in the extreme the council override are ways to kind of get at that. Right. right. Yep. Yes. So, so is, is everybody in agreement that we're okay with, in this particular aspect of this, we're okay with not responding to the survey? Mm -hmm. okay. On the next one, um, we've used the 30% design level. Um, Daryl raised this question that, it, you know, some people might feel it's not quite sufficient for consideration of construction aspects or impacts. What happens if controversy occurs later in the design process? And I think that the sense of this process is that you'd have to go back for a community meeting, you know, if something came up that we discovered a utility line we didn't know about or some other kind of issue that, that would come up. But is there a different approach or something about how you would handle this? When you say if, consideration of construction impacts, um, does that mean that if you get, let's say you're to the 50% design level and it turns out that you can't build a sidewalk there, you have to go there and right. into somebody's yard? I mean, I think that the intention, you know, the sense of this is that we would take that back to the community for a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's the way that it was proposed was that basically at the 30% level you could kind of give a go, if people voted for it, they could do a go ahead for construction and Oh. And that was that. So, I mean, I, I, from a practical point of view, I mean, Daryl and I would never say, oh, yeah, just go ahead and change that all <laughs> and don't tell anybody. I mean, that's just not how we do it. But um, Well, and I think the other thing that we're trying to do, and it's unspoken here, is there's a lot of cost in, in going to find, you know, more and more refined design. And given the, I think, um, significant threshold of 50% of respondents, It'll be rare where we get an approved sidewalk through the design process. So, you know, trying to balance that out with not spent, not getting these 100% construction drawings done to not build. Um, you know, we sort of feel like 30% is enough, but we all need to acknowledge that it's it's not the construction drawings. Um, it is a concept that's a third of the way through uh, the design process. I'm um, sorry, Daryl. Did I just hear you say that you thought that? You thought it would be rare that using a 30% drawing you get a majority? I think it'll be rare that we'll get a 50% vote. On anything? On any, on any survey we do. In any of the give, sidewalks give, we give, already Given that it has to be 50% of, of the universe of yeah. the room. Particularly multifamily. I think that'll pretty yeah. much eliminate much of the sidewalks we've been through design on. Yeah. Councilmember Schultz and then Councilmember Clark. Yeah, in, in the Ward 6 experience, the 30% level was terrifically adequate for educating and helping people who showed up at the meetings to understand a meaningful 
to get a really good good grasp of what what was uh, being talked about. But uh, but I, I would say that you know it, it, beyond that point, it, it, it would depend on the reason for. Uh, the, the need for a change. If it was an engineering reason, you know, then I think you'd have to go back to the community and explain it. Uh, but if, on the other hand, if it's somebody who says, well, I didn't know about the meetings, uh, do you go back and start with more meetings again? And I'd rather not because that's a uh, time-consuming time and staff costs and all of that. And at some no, that's just my thought. Okay, so if your your objective is to see if there's a majority opinion for a sidewalk, then your objective is um, to design for quality sidewalks and to get to 50% um, status. So in answer to the immediate thing that you brought up, if you're looking for 50% of signatures, you're not going to have people who come back and say, I didn't hear about the meetings, because you're going to have, you, the people who want the sidewalks have gone, can go out there and talk to those people about the meetings. Um, I, I feel like, you know, we came up with a sidewalk process. It wasn't adequate for the community, and we're trying to address an adequacy issue for the community. And we live in a community of people who are used to, you know, five hundred thousand dollar evaluations for multi-billion dollar federal spending projects, and and I, I don't say that this is not a disparage comment. I'm not being disparaging. I mean, that's just what their like. That's what their mindset is, and so they're looking for you know the evaluation, the perfect information, um, and we don't have that, and we have to keep that in mind. But um, the other thing that people are looking for is just. Um, a, a process that they can work through in their community, and so that's part of what we tried to address. So, I, I started from the assumption that Ward Six is the model. Mm -hmm. So, what I have heard and witnessed and and gotten from city staff and from you and from people who have participated in the process, that people are are concerned about sidewalks when they are in the abstract, and somebody says. They're going to cut down every tree in your yard and plow a ten-foot path through your yard, and then you know the, those kinds of things. And it's and it, then they're afraid. They, but the design process um, shows people what you're really talking about and gives them control. Because if you look at the Ward Six process, okay, so they did the 30% design, and then the people said no because this is what really happens at this intersection and. I don't like this because this takes out this old tree and these trees are dying anyway if we move it over to the other side of the street. So in Ward 6 you move the sidewalks from one side of the street to the other yeah. in the next phase of the design process. And I think that what we have to balance is that we tell people this is how you access the program. I mean this is what I was thinking. This is how you, this is how you access it. This is how you get it started and this is how you make the final decision. And in between there between the neighbors can ask for it, the community association can ask for it, the city can ask for the design process, the planning process to start for any of the reasons that we've already outlined. And, okay, we've got what we think is the finalized process. Let's see if half the people agree to it, which is essentially what we're doing already, but just without a formalized vote, is this process that is, you know, this... I think it's an iterative process, if you would, but, you know, it's back and forth between the folks that at some point... Um, we can't we can't regulate or legislate or create rules for all those component pieces. We have to trust the staff to do that part of the work. So, you know, we get the we get the process rolling. If you get to the thirty percent design phase and you can't get agreement from anybody about where to go next, I think you're dead in the water because you can't. You have to come up with a solution that gets you to half of the people supporting the sidewalk. And if people in the community want the sidewalk, they'll talk to their neighbors about it. And you think about Central Avenue as a, as a model. People are concerned about the sidewalks there. They're concerned, and there it's not trees as much as is they're concerned about the impact on the runoff. Um, the conversations help. 
um, but they want the they wanted the city to take some sort of a lead in telling them how they'll make the decision instead of well let us know what you come up with and we'll decide whether or not that's an adequate decision making process. So we're telling them we're giving them what they asked for. This is how the decision gets made. Um, I have confidence that the the Long Branch Sligo Neighborhood Association and the folks on Central Avenue can get together and converse with their folks and make a determination that gives. You know, the people who live on the run of the street, the essentially the final say, they listen to the people in the other parts of the community when they're making those decisions. And so I just feel like at some point it's going to have to be up to the staff whether you move from a 30% design to a 50% design or an 80% design and you keep, you know, you keep investing more money in it as you're getting closer to a majority opinion. We're not going to be able to make rules for that here. I, I think we have to go getting the process started and how we make the final decision and, and let the staff work the way that community development planners work, working with the community to come to some consensus with copious amounts of help from the Neighborhood Association, the mayor, and the city council person. Well put. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. Five words. Okay. No, that was good. I think number three is... We'll, we'll let the staff and the process work its way out. Yes. Yes. For number four, we answered this before. Um, only yes votes count out of the total um, number of households, and uh, owners who are not resident households don't have a vote. For number five, um, the, this is just to confirm that when the staff identifies what the run is, that's the that's the area for the vote. Right, to clarify if it's two blocks. It might be a two block run. It might be two one block runs. It, it just depends on, on what the right, con on what the connection possibilities does, are. Is this, does this question address a two block run and 40% of the people on one block vote for it and 70% of the people on the other block vote for it? Then, then the neither side. would get it. Neither then, would because get it. Then, because we can't build half a run. So, okay, so you're not considering the entire run as all the households and 50% of those households? We, we are. I mean, basically, it, but what I'm saying is there, if it's a two-block run, mm -hmm. if in order to make the connection it lasts two blocks, mm -hmm. we need to get 50% of the people on that full two-block run. Okay. So and, you, and, and if it just so happens anecdotally that everybody on one block wants it and everybody on the other block doesn't want it, that doesn't matter. It's, it's it doesn't totally matter. Enough. It will be built if there's more people, or if there's if there's the same number of households on each block. There's it, ten it, houses it, on it, one if, block. If there's, there's the if there's the fifty percent right. out of the total okay. run, then it can go forward. Right. Okay. So ten houses on each block. Ten on one say yes. Ten on the other say no. It gets built. That's correct. Okay. Just just clarifying. Well, sure. Council Member Klein. So I, I think that's true, but there is there. I think there's one other element of that that we need to address and that is blocks where there's no resident um, that has an address that faces that street um, and places where maybe there's only one or two people because you'd hate to let one or two people as, as I think is the point that you're trying to um, uh, get to is that you hate to let one or two people be able to stop a, a run of sidewalk that is, you know, six blocks, six blocks long. And so I think maybe we should say um, uh, where there's no residents with an address in that section of block, or where there's fewer than three households along a block, that we would average them. I, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. Just my gut feeling. First, the, 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 one of the things that I would see would be it would be the property that abuts where the sidewalk goes. So the house may face the side street. Nevertheless, I would count that as a household because it's abutting their property. I, that's right. you know. I mean, I think that that's. That ends up being important because it's what they're used to having on the side of their house. Right. Um, the in terms of the minimum number. On one hand, I you know I like the idea, but I could see if if I'm the only household on the street and I really don't want it, I can, <laughs> you know I wouldn't like to say oh well there's only one of you so you don't count. 
I mean, I, 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 this is a place where I, I actually see where the city council might make an opinion about about what makes sense at that point on that particular case. Okay. Um, right. And I, I think that's what we're doing now is the city council is making right. our opinion made on this particular policy please, issue. Please, please do. On so your, what, can you what, clarify what, what you're saying? Clarify. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want a, a person's voice not to be heard. I don't want a single person who happens who happens by circumstance to be the only person in a, a section of block, like let's say where you have two streets that um, are that come together very uh, closely. You have a bunch of them in your ward. Right. And so you might have a, a, a run that's five blocks long and there's five households on this block and seven households on this block and um, one household on this some little corner of a section um, and then, you know, five more households. You wouldn't want one person to be able to stop 20 households. I mean, I think but it's a difference Colleen, between... No, because it would be the whole run. The whole it, would run. Be, right. it would be the majority of the whole run, so it might be multiple blocks, but it's the total of the households on that run. If there were 20 households on the run and the one guy or gal said no, that's only one twentieth. It's not... He can't... So block. it's the average of the entire run. Correct. That's right. Okay, Correct. great. Then I don't have a problem with that. There you go. Okay. That solved that problem. Good. <laughs> yeah. We agree on that one. Mm-hmm. So if you don't get the vote you want, you just extend the run longer. <laughs> well, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. I'm sure there. I'm sure there will be some pressure on what the run is. Yeah, that's the run. The, the finding the run is very important. Right. But, but then I guess I'm confused about you, the way you've worded this because this. What this, this, this did we? Did we? So we did, did we decide to change that so that we're averaging the entire run instead yes, of block by yes. block? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I missed that. that. That's what I get for typing. Colleen, the, the problem, no, and I think through. there is going to always be confusion. When we <laughs> identify runs, sometimes a run is multi-block mm -hmm. as one run, and sometimes we may have two adjacent blocks that are two separate runs because there's ways to make connections. Okay. So part of this is going to have to be what, when we look okay. down at what that, what the, where the connections are, um, where the existing sidewalks are and how this blocks. Yeah. That's right. Uh, okay. So that's, that's, I think, where some of the confusion lies. Okay. And we have answered number six. I think people feel that the council gets an override mm -hmm. if they feel mm -hmm. like. And what would that see. process be? The staff would just bring it to you and say the, end, the conclusion of this process is this was a highly rated or important sidewalk to city staff or brought by the Neighborhood mm -hmm. Association. We went through the process. We did the vote. We don't have the votes. What do you want to do? We, then it would, be, it would be a resolution things. before mm -hmm. you. We're, we're always going to be voting on these. Like but we know we wouldn't bring them back to you. We would, 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 would vote on a negative yeah. because it wouldn't get to us. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's we good. wouldn't bring it back. Would, would we, would, but that raises an interesting question. If we've gone through the process and this block really wants sidewalks and it's voted and it's voted yes, we wouldn't need to bring it back to city council, I think. It would just go into the queue because it was a successful answer. Would you, were you seeing that it, it, even after all the yeses it would come back to you? I don't think so. Well, and I think in some ways it depends on where it, where it fits in the budget cycle. If we have funding available and no other sidewalks and it comes up, then I, I would think that we run at least some internal communication that we've gone through this process. We're right. going to go to construction. If if we've got 10 in the queue and we've got no funding and it's going to come up in the next budget year when we're talking about capital budget, you'll see that in your mm -hmm. capital budget item. And we'll say, here's the approved sidewalks and here's what we need to fund them. And you set your funding level based on what we've got in the queue. I would also assume, Daryl and, and Suzanne, that... Um, once a year or maybe, maybe more often or whatever, you would come to the council and say, well, here's, here's the plan for here's sidewalks the, for this year. Yeah, this is what we're doing in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. but, to, but I think to answer that question, would we then, so if, it's, if the vote fails to hit, hit a 50 percent, do we want to say that the neighborhood, exam, the neighborhood association then, I mean, do we even have to say that? Because quite frankly, we had one where we had a fail and you had this instance that, was it, was it Josh who said, I can't remember who said that, like, if, if some child, you know, three children had been hurt, but the people on this particular block didn't, um, didn't want to mm -hmm. have the sidewalks, but we thought it was a need. Would we allow the, the Neighborhood Association to bring it back to us um, as an overall neighborhood request or a city staff member to put it on the 
agenda as a as a staff need. I mean, or a council member man. But they would do we would do that anyway. I mean, that just happens. The flexibility yeah. to bring it back. Yeah, that just happens. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. so, so. Okay, going back to um, the Ward Six sidewalks, uh, Councilmember Schultz. Um, I had gotten the sense from you that you were concerned about the at the design level just having the the residents on the side where the sidewalk is to be built would vote on it that that you were concerned about that. Well, what I'm trying to say this is that we we started this process more than three years ago now. It started out as traffic calming, and we did. And the city responded and put some stuff in there to ameliorate the problem. But yeah. sidewalks uh, became a question when the tool design thing came <coughs> in. It was a, and it was realized that of all the wards, Ward Six had the, by far the fewest sidewalks. And because we have a lot of kids that go to the school up there, uh, what's it called? The elementary rolling terrace, rolling terrace uh, plus the shopping centers and all the bus stops all along New Hampshire. The bias in, in the ward is that we need sidewalks. Um, and so we started having meetings about sidewalks. And this was before we got into this current uh, uh, debate that we're into now. And we moved that process through the 30% level. Uh, and almost to the finish line, except for one more meeting in, in uh, New Hampshire Gardens uh, to, to kind of do some workarounds with some obstacles that the engineers discovered as they got deeper into the engineering. Uh, with, and with the understanding that they'd come back and then the sidewalks were, would be built this fiscal year. In fact, originally it was told we were you know, Daryl said it was going to be, these sidewalks could put, were going to be built in the previous fiscal year just ended, but you know for obviously good reasons that didn't happen. And with regard to the uh, was it the 7800 block but that's the, the one between Ann and Kirkland, it was said that we were going to hold up building the sidewalk until the the street gets lots of really long block gets paved. And we'll do do the sidewalk simultaneously with that, and everybody said, "All right, we'll wait." So, those people in New Hampshire Gardens are sort of in a pending frame of mind that they've gone through all these discussions and wondering where the sidewalks are going to be, when they're going to be built. The exception to that is on the other side of New Hampshire, which you know about, uh, and that's a different. That's I'm prepared to handle that differently because there's some serious disagreement in the community about Erskine Avenue, Erskine Street. But that's, that's where we are there. And, so, and I think if we were, or I were to go back to the community, well, I, I practically know that, there, there would be kind of dismay if we said, well, we've got to go through this process of voting, because they would sort of say, well, you know, I don't need to elaborate. My, my sense is we're, 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 we're holding Ward 6 up as, as kind of the model process to base this new one on. You've been through the process. Why would we want to make you jump through more hoops? Right. Yeah, I, I we would, haven't I done ask. a survey there. We haven't, we haven't gotten official. We haven't gotten a formal count back. We've right. just made the presentation. We haven't asked the vote. What, what would your guess be that both, both well, of you said and Daryl about is, would you get the vote? We we uh, had several meetings, and the the last meeting uh, in New Hampshire Gardens it was to, uh, a, a first class letter was sent out to all the residents of New Hampshire Gardens, not just the ones on the Wildwood Drive, for mm -hmm. example, uh, and a. I don't know, maybe 15 people showed up, 20 at most, for the meeting. And um, that was it. And there was a big, there was a discussion, and one or two people in the meeting lost their temper and were opposed to it and thought that this was just going to be the, the end of the world. But, but by and large, the, the, most of the people in the meeting were satisfied. One, one guy, I asked him, a homeowner, and he said, well, you know, uh, I, you know, it's, 
this is a good idea. It's going to require me to re-landscape my front yard and to tear down, lose this old tree, but I think it's a good idea to have a sidewalk. And it looks like it, if it needs to be on my side of the street, then that's where it needs to be. Okay, so that's I can an introduce an, you to the guy. That's an, that's an anecdotal issue, but would you, could you yeah, expand sorry. that and say that 50% of the people in your no, estimation No, I can't say that because okay. I don't know. I mean, I, it's just... It's, it's who shows up after sure. trying diligently, I mean, making a, a reasonable effort to get mm -hmm. people to come out. Well, we've got a real mix there. You've got Wildwood, which is largely single family. We've got Kennewick, which is entirely garden style, mm -hmm. four and six unit apartment buildings. We never got anybody to attend mm -hmm. any of the three meetings mm -hmm. that we held. Um, we, mm -hmm. we mailed to each house, we delivered flyers to each house, and we sent a letter to the owner. Mm -hmm. We got nothing from any of them. That's so I think in some Plus cases, we, serve notices. We, won't, we won't get response not from opposition or support, just right. from not on the radar. And there's, there, is, there is the aspect that some people truly are indifferent. They, it's just, I mean, we want them to care, we think they should care, but they actually just, it doesn't really make any difference to them. Right. If they don't have a sidewalk, they're not really eager about it. But if they do, they just sort of say, well, that's, that's all right. But, you know, do you understand? It's, it's not opposition. It's not enthusiasm. It's just like, okay. I, I, I don't know what you do with that. That's why, why I'm, I'm... You keep on going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I sort of feel like you just keep on going because I, my 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 eye, speaking of ideo ideologies, my feeling is is that sidewalks, all things being equal, ought to be built. If we're, well, we're that's clear, building. Fred. Well, you've been so, you've been consistent so, on that. So, so we, we're not. There's no dispute. So on that's that one. that's how I come at it. Uh -huh. I, beyond that, I don't know what else to. Uh, how else to, if I've answered your question at all, uh, Well, I Suzanne. think this is, I mean, the question is for the full council. Yeah. And that is, do you want to have the city staff do the survey approach for the Ward 6 sidewalks, or do you want to say, this is kind of grandfathered in and we're going to do a different way? Right. And, and defer to whatever Fred wants. And is Fred, you mentioned the two, the one, the the process you've already had, mm -hmm. and then the Erskine other side part. Do you see differenti some differentiation there, so that you you would be comfortable taking the work that you've done so far and just kind of rolling with it, but keeping the Erskine side and doing the process that we've outlined. Yes, exactly. That would, that would yeah. be acceptable. To yeah, you. I think on the Erskine side, uh, the people there uh, enough enough people. I don't know whether it's two or three and they're representative of, of a lot more opposition or whether they're just an isolated few who are opposed. But I think we uh, have to honor that by having a survey. I'm, I'm with Josh. I support, I support that, uh, that approach. You're, you know, what is is there support? anyone who disagrees with what Councilmember Schultz just laid out? Clear enough? We are all in agreement. So but there's going to be one more meeting and then go forward with sidewalks. Correct. That's my understanding. Okay. Fine. All That's good. All the nursing. Okay. Is there anything else that Steph needs? I don't think so. We'll try and modify this from what you said today and, and send it out. And we appreciate it. Thank you for, for your efforts. I mean, I really, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Okay. Um, just one other quick final note. I was took my mother to the doctor today and she pulled out a clipping from the Gazette from whatever version she gets and it was an article that included some mention of the public works director and it was something that I wasn't aware of and she was like, oh, but I thought you knew everything that went on in town. And I was mm -hmm. like, no, I don't know everything. And so it may have just escaped my attention. Somebody may have already brought it up here, but it was about you getting appointed to a state group of like 12 people and it had to do with uh, electrical electric, charging station electric okay. vehicle infrastructure uh, committee the uh, governor has set up a, a committee to look at um, encouraging electric vehicle use in the state and uh, it was we had our first official meeting today apparently the last meeting of the earthquake the meeting got interrupted as all the DOT people <laughs> scattered out to figure out if they had any bridges left <laughs> and uh, 
so it was the first meeting today, but it's uh, it's uh, you know directed by the governor and it'll be uh, going through a process of an interim report in January of 2012 and a final report in December 2012. And I learned quite a bit. Uh, the state of Maryland has been very aggressive in capturing federal dollars and putting a lot of plans in place for um, the electric vehicle. Just support. We're all very Just pleased. I represent MML. Right. I was going to yeah. say she's one of the two MML representatives. Uh, we represent kind of the smaller town here. Urban, urban, urban municipalities in yeah. MML. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, and uh, it sounds like uh, we could get some uh, beneficial information from that. It's, it's been a real learning process, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> okay. We're adjourned. Love it. I'm Daryl. We have a we have a button in our office. A button. No.